Hey, Melvin. Hi, Ashley. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Good. I'm so sorry for all those technical difficulties today. Oh, not, not, a, not a problem. Not a problem at all. <laughs> We're just we're just getting set up here on this side, and uh, we should be rolling along pretty well. Hello, Amy. Welcome. Hi. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. We're just just getting ourselves started here, and uh, hoping everything goes smoothly. It's okay. It's okay if it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it will. It, it's it's got to it's got to go smoothly. So we're we're just getting ourselves set up here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay. We're, we're, we're good. Okay, I'm gonna go off camera for just a second. I'll be right back. Hey, Amy, <laughs> I'm Ashley. How are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good, where are you coming in from? I'm in Kansas City right now at the American Royal actually for one of our national championships. How about you, are you in Lexington? Yeah, I'm in Lexington, I'm actually in my home office. Oh. <laughs> Because we were having some computer issues in my at work, and I was like, "I'm just gonna go home. I can set up there. It'll be fine." So yeah. that's always good. Oh my gosh, yeah. I think we're all getting pretty good at the. Just I'm just gonna go home and use my whole internet. <laughs> yeah, I know how it all works. I know mm -hmm. when you something goes wrong. So. <laughs> oh man. Great. Okay, we're we're trying to get everything together, and I think we're we're almost there. Hello, Tori. Welcome. Hi. Sorry. One minute. One minute. <laughs> um, I mean, I just had to like, log on. Hi. I'm sorry. There you are. There you are, Tori. <laughs> But I am just happy that everyone was able to make the time today to, uh, you know, make this happen. This is uh, really, really quite good. Hello, Martha. Welcome. Uh, Emily, welcome. Hi, Melvin. Thank you. How good. Are you? I'm well. I'm well. You know. Uh, can't complain about anything. <laughs> Good. <laughs> you know, considering all of the things that uh, could have gone wrong, uh, I think we're it's, the fact that we're all coming together is is, is miraculous. <laughs> We've been working through uh, some technical issues all morning, and. Uh, we're, we're just about there, you know. Uh, we got our videos to play very well, but unfortunately, uh, the audio for some reason, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, problem in Zoom uh, that uh, the audio is uh, not uh, showing. So we're gonna have to post those to the web, but we're still good, we're still good. Jean-Philippe, welcome. Hey. Hi. <laughs> welcome. Nice to see you. Yes, thank you, thank you for joining us. So we're going to uh, pick up in just a few minutes. Uh, we'll give a time for, for more of our audience to come on board. But uh, I wanna thank everyone uh, from the bottom of my heart for making the time to make this happen. Uh, we had the first Tom Bass uh, seminar last year uh, here in Tryon at the uh, Tryon International Equestrian Center. Uh, very successful, very uh, thought provoking day but little did we have any idea of all of the challenges that we would all be facing here in 2020. 
So the fact that uh, we've been able to come together again and, and have an even bigger and better uh, seminar uh, really speaks to the seriousness uh, with which people have taken the issue of diversity uh, in the equestrian community. And I can't thank you uh, enough uh, uh, for, for making this happen and for everyone coming together. Uh, in the next few hours, we're going to hear some wonderful presentations, uh, both from people here in the United States and from our friends and colleagues overseas. Uh, it is a time that the world is looking at issues of diversity. The world is looking at issues of fairness and inclusion. And so we in the equestrian community uh, have continued uh, to a discussion that has been going on for some years now. Uh, and I think it's a very, very important decision. So we'll be hearing, we look forward to hearing from uh, those here in the United States, as well as uh, our friends and colleagues from overseas who will be joining us. I think we've, we've, we've put together a, a pretty impressive group of people with a lot of ideas, a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different life experiences. And I think that it, it really stands as a testament to, to the, what we're, we're talking about. It's a very, very serious, serious subject. Uh, and there's some very interesting initiatives that are underway uh, across the world uh, to, to, to kind of change things, you know? Uh, I, I will be talking about that, uh, you know, throughout the afternoon. So uh, bear with us for just a few more minutes. We'll give, give some more of our, our friends and colleagues time uh, to log on and uh, we'll, get, we'll, we'll get going. Can you hear me, Melvin? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thanks. Just checking in from the boonies. <laughs> no, I can, I can, I can, I, I can hear you. Uh, you may want to turn your volume up just a little bit, but uh, other than that, I, I can certainly hear you. Ashley, I seem to have uh, two connections for you. Uh, one, I assume, is for your, your presentation. Yes, if you wouldn't mind um, letting the one that just has my name share the screen. I'll That's fine. The okay, there. okay. That's fine. Okay. What I'm, uh, Ashley, what I'm going to have to do then is make you the host temporarily. And then when you finish, if you can just hand the hosting back to me, we'll go from there, okay? Okay, we'll wait another minute or two and then, and then, and then get going. Welcome, Sandra. Hi, how are you? <laughs> oh, fine, thanks. <laughs> good, good to see you. Good My to see pleasure. You. So, so happy to have you join us from the UK. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, miracles of technology. I know, isn't it amazing? Isn't oh, it, amazing? it is, it is. How you can just be joined up and, and it's like real time and we're all talking together. It's fantastic. It is, it is, it is. <laughs> Mia, welcome. She's connecting to her audio. Hello. Hello, Hello Mia. Welcome. Okay, there you are. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Good, good. No, that's that's fine. That's sort of been the the um, Order of the day. Welcome, Elizabeth. <laughs> so happy to be here. Thank you. Good, good, good. Well, we have people with us so far from uh, around the world. I'm looking at the screen and I'm seeing uh, friends from uh, a variety of different places. And uh, uh, we'll go ahead and get started so that we can uh, at least make an effort to stay on time today. Um, welcome, everyone, to the second Tom Bass uh, seminar on issues of diversity in the equestrian sports. Uh, as I was saying earlier, we met last year in person uh, here at the Tryon International Equestrian Center uh, in North Carolina. And little did we know uh, how our worlds would change uh, in just a few months. 
And so it is a testament to the vibrancy of our community that we have found ways yet to come together and talk about some very, very serious issues that, that are facing all of us and hopefully come up with some ideas and some solutions that will make life a lot better for everyone uh, around the world who loves horses. And uh, so I just thank everyone again for, for making time today and for making this a priority because I know that a lot of people have a lot of other things going on in their lives and it's very, very uh, heartening to have everyone come together. Uh, we're going to start off uh, with our first panel. Uh, the domestic uh, panel that are going to really kind of look at some of the issues and we want to talk about some of the issues uh, that involve equestrians here in the United States. Uh, we'll spend our first hour talking about uh, things domestically. Uh, we're going to hear uh, a couple of very outstanding presentations uh, from the United States Equestrian Federation and also from the International Museum of the Horse. Uh, in our second hour, we're going to actually talk to some of our outstanding young uh, horse people uh, because I think it's very important that those of us who are a little bit older uh, make time to listen to our youth and to pass on some of our knowledge and wisdom and also to gain some of their knowledge and wisdom. So the second hour will be dedicated to youth. Uh, and then uh, we're going to have a wonderful uh, media panel uh, that is going to discuss uh, the, how things can be changed, how the media uh, can go about changing uh, perceptions in the equestrian world. Uh, and the, some of the mistakes that have been made and some of the progress that has been made. Uh, and finally, we have an absolutely outstanding international panel. And we'll be hearing from a variety of international equestrian uh, personalities with many, many, many decades of uh, knowledge and experience. And we really, really, really look forward to hearing from all of you. So uh, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and start with our domestic panel. Uh, let me say that the technical uh, goblins have been uh, at work with us uh, earlier today. We had a couple of very, very important videos that we wanted to share. Uh, Unfortunately, the pictures come through, but the sound does not. So what we're going to be able to do is post those to the website. I'll send out links to each of you tomorrow uh, so that you can uh, look at those at those videos and have an, have an opportunity to really look and see what we're doing. But we're going to go ahead and get started now, if we can, uh, with our uh, first panel, which is the uh, domestic panel. Uh, Ashley uh, Swift is representing uh, the United States Equestrian Federation. Uh, and we're going to start with Ashley uh, and a very interesting presentation that uh, the USEF has put together. As many of you know, uh, they've been one of the organizations that has taken the lead in actually uh, speaking of and putting on paper uh, a plan for, for, for greater diversity within equestrian sports. So I think it's very important that we start with the uh, presentation by the United States Equestrian Federation. Uh, and then we will be joined a little bit later uh, by the representative of the International uh, Museum of the Horse. Ashley. Hey everyone, um, thanks for having me today. My name is Ashley Swift. I work for the US Equestrian Federation in the marketing department. I've been there for about three years. Um, let's see if I can share my screen with you. Give me just a second here. And I also have a video, so we'll do our best with that one and hopefully it will all work out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get this big, great. Uh, so yeah, I'm really excited to walk through um, the last few years of DEI related work at USCF, including a high level overview of our action plan. Um, thank you, Melvin, for including us today and giving us this opportunity to share what we've been working on for the past few months. So US Equestrian's Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Action Plan outlines 10 strategies that seek to advance DEI in equestrian sport. The strategies uh, harness our strengths as a sport and address challenges in an impactful, sustainable way. Our sport is perceived in such a way that means we have to be consistently working in the DEI space. So ensuring our resources are devoted to high impact yet maintainable strategies is essential to our vision of bringing the joy of horse sports to as many people as possible. Uh, earlier this year, the board of directors approved the DEI action plan and a commitment statement 
uh, which reads as, Diversity and inclusion are fundamental to U.S. Equestrian's vision to bring the joy of horse sports to as many people as possible. We recognize the need to achieve increased diversity and that our growth and success depends on the inclusion of all people. We are committed to providing access and opportunity for people of color, the LGBTQ community, veterans and active military personnel, people with disabilities and those of all ages, religions, ancestries, genders and gender identities and economic status to harness the synergy of diverse talents. So how did we get here? Uh, in 2018, the marketing department began participating in the USOPC's, uh, so the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee's Diversity Champions yeah. Initiative and saw a pattern of changing member demographics, particularly for race. We decided to take a closer look at those demographics in-house and saw a small but consistent trend of increased racial diversity over the last 20 years. We'll get more into that in a second, um, but our communications team that decided to set a stronger intention to improve representation for underrepresented races, body types, socioeconomic backgrounds, and more through images, videos, stories, and devoting more resources to our affiliates. Uh, our human resources department also set out to implement staff training requirements in diversity, inclusion, and implicit bias. And our first public communication to members explicitly around racism, at least in my time at USCF, was um, participating in Blackout Tuesday on social media. Uh, this was a campaign that went viral on Instagram in response to the murder of George Floyd. And uh, we also issued a letter from CEO Bill Moroney condemning racism, outlining action steps, and sharing a racial justice Thank you. Resource, sharing a racial justice resource guide. We received overwhelming support um, for these communications um, from the community, as well as a healthy amount of skepticism, I think. And I saw a huge jump in engagement from our Black members and fans um, interacting with our platforms. So we'll give this video a try. Um, so we were specifically requested to include this video that we uh, showed at our annual meeting in January of this year, which centered around the theme of focus on the future. Um, before, just to preface the video, we did not target any particular breed, discipline, or demographic, um, but we're pleasantly surprised by the organic engagement we received from youth across the spectrum of horse sports. So we'll give this a go. Let me know if you can't hear it, Melvin. Okay. I'm Bella. I'm 15 years old and I love riding because of the sense of freedom that it gives me. My name is Emily Robinson. This is my horse Gravity. I'm Ryder Richardson and this is my pony RR Cool Play. My name is Sarah Harris. I'm 15 years old. I ride a horse named Jansis. My name is Angelica Miranda. I'm 12 years old and I ride fossil fuel horses. I'm Catherine Casey and I ride Western. My name is Grayson. I'm 12 years old and I ride a hunter jumper bar. Oh. <laughs> I started riding when I was really young. When I was five years old. When I was eight years old. When I was 11. I started in third grade. And ever since then, I've just wanted to ride, ride, ride. that kid who at birthday parties where there were pony rides, I was the first one on and the last one off. It started out as a hobby, but soon became my passion and it changed my life. Being able to form a partnership with a horse is absolutely incredible. Horses are amazing. They are so easy to bond with and I love being around them. The reason why I love horses is because they teach me so much about life. I love horses because they're cute, soft, and cuddly. I love horses because, I mean, who doesn't love horses? Oh my gosh, this pony is so snuggly. I'm Isabella Kraft. I'm 13 years old from Pennsylvania. I compete in Area 2. I live in Oregon and compete in Zone 9. Dan and I enjoy competing in dressage and show jumping. I've been riding dressage for nine years. I enjoy dressage because of the balance, harmony, and partnership you build with your horse. I do eventing. I do hunters and eventing, and I do jumpers with my six-year-old thoroughbred one-one crossman, Carlita. I ride Morgans and Ravens. We compete in country pleasure, salsi division. He do hot seat and he also drives. Me and the horse, but they're in the air. So I'm going to be getting pony class. 
I arrived Sunday, 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 College. I am part of an IHSA team at the University of Lynchburg. I ride dressage, eventing, and jumpers. I'll ride any horse that I can, and I'm open to all the oh, disciplines. I've had a lot of success at horse shows this year. My goal is to someday be in the Olympics and then the FBI. I'm 13 years old and I'm from Norco, California. And this is my American Saddlebred DJ. He's a five-year-old Morgan. Riding has always been the highlight of my life. Horses have enriched my life in so many ways. Working with horses really opens your eyes to incredible possibilities. And I, 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 I am the future. No, I'm really glad I'm, I'm, I'm on. One of our personal favorites at USCF. I'm really proud of that one. Um, and I think it's a good representation, representation that we have a long way to go. Um, but our youth are yeah, that's fun. You guys. diverse. And you know, I know here we're talking a lot about racial diversity. So we're seeing more of that. Um, which I mean, I'm like, back to our I can't, um, annoying, they can't, information. Well, I probably could fuck about it. At least I've got it. And they can't hear that. So. Uh, so this graph can be found in the action plan online. Yeah, yeah. Somebody needs to mute this chat. I can't read it. Can everyone please mute their mic? This is the story of the man behind the propaganda. Need to mute everybody now. Okay, uh, Ashley, are you going to... We reveal the truths about the man That's so brilliant. long celebrated as a great hero. Oh, I can meet them. Julian, Julian Senior. Hello, I'm here. You need to mute your mic because you're, you're interfering with the presentation. Thank you. Sorry about that. I didn't realize I was the only host. I just thought I was a co-host. Sorry, no one. Okay. Are we good? Okay. Sound? Okay. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Okay. Um, so yeah, great video. Um, I'm sorry, my was on okay. mute still. Um, really fun to watch. And so it leads perfectly into um, looking a little bit closer into our racial demographics. Um, <clears throat> this graph can be found in our action plan online. Um, essentially, we are slowly, slowly, but consistently seeing more racial diversity over the last 20 years. Um, this graph shows all members, but when we segment out for youth only, we see slightly more um, racial diversity and the most growth amongst youth members are those identifying as two or more races. So, you know, this is just further evidence that it's so important to be inclusive and to keep these increasingly diverse youth members in the sport through increased representation in marketing materials and communications, through opportunities to participate in horse sports at their universities, um, and by increasing the visibility of career options in the industry beyond rider and trainer. So developing the DEI action plan, we believed it was important to have a sports perspective um, outside of the equestrian world and hired Ashlyn Johnson as a DEI consultant to help us focus um, many ideas and opportunities into a tangible action plan. Ashland is the president and founder of the Inclusion Playbook, a sports adv advocacy group that has worked with the USOPC, other national governing bodies, and organizations like the NBA and the NCAA to make the most out of the transformative power of sports for advancing DEI in their respective spaces. So following the board of directors approval of a commitment statement and the development of the action plan in June, staff representatives from every department uh, within US Equestrian set out to create a strategic intentional plan um, with input from external leaders representing diverse backgrounds, life experiences and positions in the equestrian industry. Three distinct working groups were formed for an overarching roundtable of thought leaders, um, the internal thought leaders, which was USCF staff, the external thought leaders um, comprised of representatives from sectors across the industry and the review committee of USCF executive staff, board members, and uh, athletes. These groups worked in partnership to create the DEI action plan. Um, we conducted a series of workshops, one-on-one -on -one interviews, and surveys with these groups to define priorities and develop high impact strategies that are achievable in three to five years. Um, and relevant to members from all 29 breeds and disciplines under the USCF umbrella. 
and they are meant to target a wide range of the underrepresented and underserved groups that we've identified. So after this process, um, the inclusion playbook reported that the majority of the internal and external thought leaders believed that equestrian as a sport lacked diversity, especially racial diversity and economic diversity. The groups also believed that the equestrian space was not particularly inclusive for racial minorities or differently abled bodies. While there are certain challenges outside of equestrian sports control, such as systemic economic disparities and other realities commonly associated with horse sports, like the amount of space needed to keep a horse or to do a certain discipline, we also have strengths that really helped guide the development of the 10 strategies, including our broad network of affiliates and sponsors, motivated staff and access to economic resources. Um, our strategies will be rolled out in phases, are to be achieved in three to five years, and are segmented out into three categories, people, policies, and practices. Approaching this phased rollout strategically and with intention will help ensure sustainable, impactful change. Uh, you know, refer to the full action plan online to learn about these strategies in more detail, but um, at top level, they are. Uh, community Riding Center Grants Program and Opportunity Fund, an inclusion commitment campaign, free DEI training that's available for members um, to complete on a voluntary basis, required DEI training for USCF representatives, rules and regulations equity audit, a new membership category for industry specialists, expanding USCF's paid internship program, a best practices guide for show organizers, Spanish translated forms and website content, and a comprehensive marketing plan harnessing the power of images and storytelling. So what's next? Um, we are so grateful for our external thought leaders, perspectives, and input, and we will continue to meet with them regularly to discuss updates and request feedback. We are committed to transparency with the membership as we move into the really action part of the action plan, and we will provide a member-wide update on progress in January of 2021. Again, these strategies will be rolled out in phases, and we are currently working on the training and the grants program slash opportunity fund. Uh, we're developing the DEI training with the inclusion playbook, uh, and that will be custom made for equestrians. We're being very thoughtful about how to approach this training. Uh, we wanna make it something engaging and practical and something that adds value to people across the spectrum of roles under the USCF umbrella. Um, we are also developing the grants criteria and an application for those community equestrian centers um, and fundraising for the opportunity fund associated with that program. So I'd just like to give um, one more shout out of appreciation to the U.S. Equestrian Board of Directors, our executive team, the review committee, the external thought leaders, um, for their continued leadership and support of the USCF staff on this initiative. It's a big undertaking and we couldn't do that without them. Um, yeah, so thank you again to everyone associated with the Tom Bass Seminar um, for inviting us to join the panel today. The link to our DEI resources is on the screen for more information. Um, and if you can't find what you're looking for there, please feel free to contact me. Thank you. I can't hear you, Melvin. I can't hear him either. You can't hear, I can't hear you, Melvin. I can't hear either. I can't hear him. <laughs> can, you hear, can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, I was, what I was saying was thanks so much to Ashley for a wonderful presentation. And uh, it was really good to see the video, uh, We Are the Future, because our young people really are the future of the sport and uh, of the world as well. So I wanted to say a special thank you to Ashley uh, and to her team at USEF. Uh, next up, we have Amy Bissell, 
uh, from the International Museum of the Horse in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, who is going to tell us about a very interesting program that they've been working on, I believe now for about two years, maybe three, uh, is a chronicle of African Americans in the horse industry. And it's something that uh, certainly as someone who grew up in the 1950s and 60s uh, and had very few uh, role models of color in this sport. It's certainly very important that we, we have this and that we chronicle the very, very rich history of African Americans and other minorities uh, and their association with the horse. So I'll be very happy to turn the floor over to Amy uh, and tell, have her tell us a little bit about the project that they're working on. Thanks, Calvin. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Sorry. There we go. Is it showing up full screen? Uh, I need you to start the slideshow. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. I'm sorry, guys. I'm just having trouble. That's okay. <laughs> there we go. Okay, here we go. So thank you, Melvin, and um, and we appreciate being invited to the Tom Bass Seminar um, this year. It's an honor to be a participant. And so um, I am the director of the International Museum of the Horse in Lexington, Kentucky, and we are located within the Kentucky Horse Park. Um, and we've been working on a project called the Chronicle of African Americans in the Horse Industry, and it's an archival project um, I'm just going to take you through and show you kind of what this project has is to us and what um, how it could be important to you and to the um, future of, um, of the horse industry. So what is the Chronicle? I'm going to be bouncing a little back and forth. I've got notes on one screen and, and, uh, and you guys on the other. Um, so the Chronicle of African Americans um, in the horse industry is a website that we have produced to um, record, preserve, and share the history of all African Americans who have worked or are working in all horse-related professions. Um, so it is an archival website. It is meant um, to call the history of African Americans in the horse industry um, and gives give the public a place to go to discover that history and to learn about the history and to share. Um, we began specifically with um, Lexington Beeston um, because what sparked this, this website development to begin with was the development of an exhibit called um, Black Horsemen of the Kentucky Turf, which is a permanent exhibit now um, in, the, in the museum that you can come and see. And in our research for Black Horsemen of the Kentucky Turf, what we found was there was a very rich history of African Americans in the horse industry in Central Kentucky, and specifically in Lexington's East End, where um, the Kentucky Association track was once located. Um, so we used the existing research from that um, exhibit um, to sort of start the conversation around um, the history of African Americans in the horse industry and um, what that looks like and, and, and the questions that developed from the development of that exhibit. Um, we are, while this is a, is a digital archive, it's also a little more than a digital archive because we are partnering with other institutions, both locally and nationwide, to again, um, help share the information that is held in different repositories and also 
in people's memories um, and in the work that they're doing currently to share with the public now. And um, we've been able to build some very useful models for collaboration and expand the partners. We're hoping to expand these partnerships in the coming years, which is potentially something everyone out here could help us do. Um, so why is the Chronicle needed? Um, it's a question that we get a lot. Um, and what we found is that African Americans' role in the horse industry has been largely overlooked and the history was poorly preserved and has been poorly preserved on a national scale. And again, this is something that we discovered in our research for the exhibit. Um, and we were able to discover the, the people who were working in the industry or who worked in the industry starting at the period of enslavement. Um, but the information around the history of their work and the lives that they lived was really, really hard to find. Um, and so as a museum, the museum field recognizes that there's an imbalance in representing the whole story in African American history um, has generally been difficult to access because of the way that African American history was not documented. Um, and so we're working towards correcting this and we're hoping that the Chronicle is gonna be able to help with that. Um, so basically what you see here is a part of the, a, a, a page on the website under research, which is people and what we have here listed in alphabetical order are our people profiles for um, the people that we have discovered, that we have spoken to, um, or that we have re researched. And this is really, this is the part that really anchors the website for us. And here is where we provide individual biographical sketches of each person. Right now, um, at the start of the website, we had over 400 individuals that we had identified as, as wanting to research and include on the website. And as of right now, we're at over 800. Um, that's increased in the last two years. And every day, we're we're being we're discovering more information, more additional people. Um, so you know, another thing is that um, the history is important to the fabric of American history, and this is something that we review in the exhibit on site as well. Is that we very much see the history of African American horsemen. Um, parallel what's going on in American history. Um, and we feel that it's worth preserving for future generations to learn and grow from. This project has been funded by um, a Museum for America uh, Learning Experiences grant um, from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Um, and the entire website can be also be used um, as an educational and research tool. And here what you see is an educator's page where any clearly um, home educators or teachers of um, any, any grade level can come to find um, modules that they can use in their classroom or with their students to teach them about American history and in parallel to African American history. We're striving for a balance of historical research and personal stories, which has made the development of this website incredibly interesting. Um, this, what you see here is the item section from the website, and this section displays digitized photos, documents, personal keepsakes, um, and just anything that is meaningful to the memory holders of the history that we are archiving. Um, so these personal and experiences and stories are, are just so important to the broader fabric of African American history and the horse industry. Um, and both in the past and as it's happening today. And I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about the relationships we've been able to develop with some of, um, some of the horsemen that are still uh, working in the industry. Um, how do we get our information is that um, we, what isn't available through research, we are trying to crowdsource. And so um, crowdsourcing is the main method for collecting these items and finding even new sources of research. 
Um, we're very interested in hearing personal stories from people who work with horses. Um, and in the past two years, we've been able to hold two different events to help collect um, information and history um, and help digitize people's personal belongings as well. Um, and those events are called History Harvest. And the people who attended, we've been able to continue to stay involved with, um, which is really great. And they've actually been able to connect us by sharing their experiences with us in the site. They've been able to connect us with additional um, horse people in the horse um, in the horse industry. And so, um, relationship building has been a huge, huge part of building this website. Um, and really what it says here, you know, is, is the truth, is that this website is, provides a platform to work toward the shared understanding of African-American experience in, in the horse industry. I could talk at length about that. <laughs> but we have a certain amount of time. Um, so what are our goals? So what you see here is um, the entry to the Black Horsemen of the Kentucky Turf exhibit at the International Museum of the Horse. But our main goals for this website are to increase the amount and quality of African-American history in American history, um, connect individuals with their past, um, and also relay to them that their past is important, um, correct the record that the horse industry was and is solely for wealthy white people, which we get a lot of assumptions about that um, even today, and build the capacity for ongoing counseling. So a little bit about the background of um, the website is that um, the website has involved a lot of community input. Um, what you see here, oops, I'm sorry, what you see here are um, some of our community members who have been involved. The large picture is our project advisory committee, and they are a group of people that have been um, selected to consult with us on um, the creation of the website. Um, our project historians um, are also part of that picture. Um, we are, um, we want to also acknowledge the, the staff and especially the founder and director emeritus of um, the, uh, the Black Horseman of the Kentucky Turf exhibit, Bill Cook, who is in um, that larger photograph sort of off to the far left. Um, and then um, Travis Robinson, who was also instrumental in developing that exhibit as well. Both of these people are now leaders of a grassroots nonprofit called Phoenix Rising Lex, and they have been instrumental, instrumental in, in the community organizing aspects of the website. Um, we also have our uh, website developers, which are, is the uh, picture of three right there on your right hand side. They are message agency. They're a company of B Corps out of um, Philadelphia that have helped us develop the site. Um, we also want to um, acknowledge our consultants and our teacher representatives, also our contributors. And so what you see um, images of here are some of our interns um, and oral historians that have been helping us with the project um, along the way. Um, so how are we doing this? It takes a lot of collaboration and a lot of partnerships. We are, we have been working with focus groups, um, community researchers and contributors. Um, focus groups, we've been working with audiences such as genealogists and descendants and teachers to get feedback on um, what they want the website to be and what is going to be um, the best way to archive um, this information. Our community researchers, um, like Yvonne Giles, who um, was the developer of African American Cemetery Number no. Two, she was the person who was in charge of the um, restoration of that cemetery, which you see there in the center. Um, she's really been a great asset as a community historian. And then our contributors who come to our events that either attend the History Harvest or call us or email us. Um, willing to share their stories or the history from their families has been just an amazing, amazing um, way to develop. We are also working on, 
these are some of the things that we have, um, that contributors have brought to us. Um, we've been getting photographs of um, family members and even themselves. And so what you see here are some of those photographs that you can also find on the website when it's publicly launched here in just a few weeks. Um, so we have the Reverend Leslie Whitlock who has submitted a photograph. Um, Bethel Ward, Robert Caldwell Jr., Joe Pena, Gregory Pena. Um, that was submitted by two separate um, families at a history harvest. Um, it was quite interesting. They both bought, brought the same photograph to us to be um, to be digitized. One was the Ward family and one was the Caldwell family. And they ended up meeting up at one of our history harvests and just hanging out and talking and learning about each other. And it was really an amazing thing to be a part of. Um, and then our last photograph there was submitted by Charles Robinson. And again, this is his grandfather, I believe, um, that worked in the, um, in the winner's circle at Cleveland. So again, these are just some memories that people have been sharing with us that we're able to um, add to the stories on the site. Um, we're getting life stories. People are going out and researching their, um, their family's history and coming to us with these incredible life stories um, about uh, horse professionals that, that have been in their family. And you can see here some that are, um, that you can also find on the site. Um, John Hughes actually um, shared um, his own story, which was really fabulous. Um, they're bringing us artifacts, things that they have in their, um, in their homes that they've kept that are family heirlooms or um, more valuable to them. And we have, you can see we have trophies and awards um, and, and paintings and drawings of family members. It's really been amazing. And then also, too, another really a wonderful thing to see by um, developing this is the accomplishments of African-American horsemen in the U.S. And, um, and sharing those accomplishments. It's been really wonderful to hear. Um, Philip Jones, that um, his Reverend Leslie Whitlock shared his, and then um, Sherman Green shared some of his family. We're getting newspaper articles. Again, these are all things that people have just kept in their families, um, have been proud of, or things that talk about the history of their family members. And these are all things that um, help us tell a richer story on the website. Keepsakes and documents. Um, that's another thing that we get a lot of, um, we we'll get licenses or um, passes or people who have biographies. Um, it's really fabulous. And then the one thing that we think is really amazing to collect are oral, oral histories. Um, and we have actually partnered with the Nunn Center for Oral History, which is um, located at the University of Kentucky. And so they're helping us to collect the oral histories and properly preserve them. And then we are able to link them on our site in those person profiles so that when you go to search for someone and they have an oral history there, you can play that oral history directly from our site and listen to their story, them telling their story themselves, which is wonderful. So one example that we have is um, the Reverend Leslie Whitlock. He groomed saddlebreds as he grew up under the guidance of horse-loving mentors, and he continues their tradition of building trust building character now as a thoroughbred owner and trainer and as a leader in his industry. And this is just an example of a person profile that you can find um, on the website. Go through and show you how everything connects. You can also um, find the contributed items. So under here, we have the photographs that he contributed along with his story, and you would be able to pull those up and learn more about what each of those items are. Um, such as this photograph of Ollie White, um, and then it, it will tell you a description that we've gotten from the contributor. Another way that we are, um, are able to uh, 
tell the history of African American horsemen is through stories, and that will link a lot of the people on the website um, so that we can we can see how their stories unfold on more of a national level. And so what you see here are some of the themes that you can find stories under. Um, and it does go fairly chronologically. So we do start before emancipation and we do start with enslavement. Um, and we go all the way through um, contemporary. So we're, we're, we are actively collecting um, about people who are currently working in the horse industry. Um, this is a sample theme. It's called Woman Up. And this is about um, African-American women in the horse industry. These are some of the stories that you can open up to read about them. And um, what we found is that these stories bring together and illustrate common experiences across the ages. So um, we're able to link some of those together. We've also developed um, an era's timeline. And these timelines show the intersection of American, African American, and horse history as their parallel. And so you can browse through that timeline and see what was going on in American history, what was happening in Amer African American history, and what was happening in the horse industry at the same time, which is sometimes just amazing to see. And then how can you help? That's pretty much the website in a nutshell. Um, but we're always looking for people to help us with that. Um, our grant time is coming to an end here in December, and we are looking to find some support, um, hopefully more permanent support, um, to keep this website going. Um, and so you can volunteer to research or conduct outreach in your community. You can write narratives and person profiles um, and submit them to the site. Um, that helps bring our materials to life. You can connect us with educators um, to research and write as class projects. Um, we are open to students um, conducting research using the site or to contribute to the site. Um, and you can also contribute your photographs, documents, letters, artifacts, and tell us your stories, whether they be your very, very own or your family's. Um, and of course, you can always donate to support the website through the Kentucky Horse Park Foundation. If you're interested in doing any of these things and or you know someone who is, um, this is how you can contact us. And, um, and you can also add your email list to our subscriber list. We send out monthly updates about what's going on with the site and what you can um, see. Thank you so much for um, your ear today and for um, and for the invitation again, Melvin. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Amy. Uh, that was very, very, very nice. Uh, are there any questions for either Ashley or for Amy uh, at this point before I introduce the other members of our first panel? Any questions? <laughs> yes, please. Um, Ashley, is there any chance that um, we could, I don't know if you're recording this, but I'm not sure, is there any chance we could have um, a copy of your um, presentation, please, because I found it very interesting, but didn't have a lot of time to take it in, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Melvin, I assume you have everybody's emails. On yes, the yes, and I, I'll be able to share it with the full group. Yeah, for sure. It's a rather large file, but we can share that. Yeah, I, I, can, I, I have it and I can share it with the, with the full group. Any other questions? Okay, Amy, uh, I had a question in terms of when the uh, chronicle of the uh, African Americans in the horse industry will be, will be fully online. We are preparing a public launch um, by the end of the month. So we're hoping by December 1st um, okay. that will be completely live. Um, we've got it online. It's just, we're still working on the back end to tweak some things visually and also to load more content onto the site. So um, we're almost there. We've got press releases and approval right now. So fingers crossed <laughs> by, by December 1st. And that can be accessed also through our, the IMH website. Okay, good. Yes, um, Sandra? Um, yeah, um, Amy, that was really, really interesting. Incredibly interesting. Um, and looking at it, I keep thinking in the UK, we need something like that to, to show the, the Bain community, the black community that we have a history 
Um, and I think it's so important because it's it's very white dominated and everything everything about the equine industry in, in the UK is very white dominated which means that we don't feel like, we, we just feel like we're visiting, we're guests, we're not actually, we haven't actually got our own foundation. And I think that would be really interesting to, to put to my group, and I'll explain about my group later on, but to put to my group for somebody to do some research on that. And I think it's great if we can chat about that later as well. I would be more than happy to talk with you. We've had, this has been an amazing growth experience for the museum and also just, um, in, in developing relationships with uh, our African-American communities that we weren't otherwise engaged with. We have um, learned so much and made so many um, great friends through this, uh, through the development of this and, and the work just continues. And we spoke a lot about opening it up to an international audience because a lot of the horsemen that we see they also had these phenomenal careers in Europe, especially mm -hmm. when you, during the Jim Crow era, where you see African-American horsemen being pushed out of the horse industry and into the, um, you know, away from the limelight. And um, we are able to highlight those individual stories that are sort of coming out of um, the United States. But right now, our team just doesn't have the capacity to um, build a, the site any larger at the moment. But if you're interested in taking on a project like that, I would be more than happy to share all of our information. So, you know, it's so exciting because um, in Liverpool, there's a, a riding school in Liverpool um, called Park Palace Stables, uh, and they are, have one of the original black um, uh, communities from when the slaves were taken from uh, UK over to, to the Americas and the Caribbean from Liverpool, from the docks. So they have a real huge, very deep um, uh, history of, of black equestrians and black, black horsemen. In, in, and so this would be so exciting for the, the guy that runs, um, you know, the Park Palace Stables, because he tells me about all his history. And, and so it all links. It's all very linked, you know. So I think, okay. yeah. And the, I bet you would find some amazing stories just developing a conversation around that because those those people they have families too and they have ancestors and there's going yeah. to be people around who know and that's yeah. one thing that we discovered is that um there's been many 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 great discoveries through the development of this website but one thing we discovered is that there's so much more history than what is readily available through research. There is so much held in people's families and in their memories and in their, um, what they, you know, in their family history that goes far beyond what we can find, you know, documented anywhere. And it's so yeah. valuable. So yeah, it's really, I encourage you to pursue it if you have a passion for it, because it's, it's an amazing, amazing project. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to have a look into that. I'm writing it down now. And <laughs> Very good. I think we well, found a, a, <laughs> a good alliance. Okay, Amy, if you can do me a favor and switch uh, the hosting back to me, I'd yeah. appreciate it. Okay, uh, at this time, I wanted to go ahead and introduce the other members of our uh, domestic panel who've been sitting very patiently. And uh, the conversation tends to go this way, but we wanted to certainly acknowledge everyone else who's here. Uh, Donna, are you are you online? I don't see your name. Uh, Donna Cheek? Okay, I guess she didn't make it. Uh, Emily Dixon is with us from Alltech. Uh, and uh, we also have Mia. Uh, and uh, last but not least, Michael Stone. So if I can just go around, we'll start with Emily, then go to Mia, and then Michael, if you can just uh, say a little bit, bit about uh, yourself, a little bit about your experience, and um, what it is that keeps you so involved in the horse business. We'll start with Emily. Hi, Melvin. Thank you for having me. It's really nice to see everyone here today. And um, yeah, what an important conversation, especially in light of everything that's gone on this year. But of course, it's always been important. Um, I'm calling in from Idaho. <laughs> I'm originally from the Seattle area, grew up riding horses, um, started at age five and kind of by chance fell into it, but um, just never stopped. I mostly grew up doing hunter jumpers. 
Um, but was at a barn that had every type of horse, skated horses, barrel horses, um, and I just rode anything to be at the barn. So that took me kind of all over the West um, to do college and my master's. So I've traveled a lot, um, Colorado, Texas, and now I'm back in Idaho working for Alltech um, in their marketing department for equine, pet, and aquaculture. So I love the industry. I love learning about it. And I think this is a super important conversation because it's not very diverse and we definitely have work to do. Okay. Mia? Hi, there. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, hi. My name is Mia Rodier Duallo. Um, that's my American name, and my true name is Mia Rodier Davalu Haji Shi. Um, I'm a Persian American from an immigrant family. Um, we have Muslim, we have Baha'i, we have all that fun stuff in our family. And um, I am ranked number three um, in the world individual ranking for paradressage of all the U.S. athletes, and I'm ranked 29th in the world of all athletes in my grade um, of every country, which is pretty cool, I'd say. Um, <clears throat> I have been riding for about 20 years and, you know, being a young brown girl in dressage, I was pretty much the only one. So it, it brings me joy to see that this is something that is finally happening after so long of feeling alienated and, and you know, unseen and unheard in, you know, the thing that's my passion, the thing that's my, my joy in life. Um, I'm so honored to be here. Like, thank you so much for having me as a panelist. And it's, it's an honor, truly. <laughs> and uh, last uh, in this grouping, but certainly not least, is a man that I've known for many, many years. Uh, I met him when he was developing the a diversity program for the FEI. Uh, he later served as the Secretary General of the FEI and for the last uh, number of years he has been the president of Equestrian Sports Productions uh, out of Wellington, Florida. He's a man who runs uh, the probably the largest horse show circuit in the world, I believe, Michael, and does an outstanding job. He's one of those people who has always, we, we would like to say, shown excellence in an effortless way. So, uh, Michael Stone, we are very honored to have you, dear friend, uh, to be part of our, our conversation today and certainly look forward to receiving uh, your, your, your in input and your unique insights into what, what this is all about. Thanks, Melvin. I, um, I appreciate it. It's, um, it's really a pleasure to, to do this and it's uh, way too long. Um, the, it's been too long that we haven't had a uh, discussion about diversity uh, in our sport. It's um, something I've always been passionate about. And way back 20, 22 years ago, when we started the uh, development program with the FEI, um, we were conscious of it then, but it's, it's always been an uphill struggle to, uh, quite apart from getting, getting in, um, more people inclusive. It's been a struggle to get it to be acknowledged that it's even an issue. And I think that's where um, seminars like this are great. And I know uh, Jean-Philippe Cambolive, who's a later panelist, he's taken over a lot of the work that I was doing. And he's um, somebody else who's very important in the worldwide uh, struggle to make, make a difference. So it's a great honor to be uh, to be part of this, and uh, I wish there was more that I personally could do um, to make a ch make changes. But all we can do is take one step at a time. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Uh, I, I'd like to just spend the next few minutes uh, just going around the around the room uh, and talking about where we're at. I mean, obviously. We're a lot further, I think, towards our shared goals than we were a year ago, certainly much closer than we were 10 years ago. But we would still have an awfully, awfully long way to go. Um, as a person of color, it's, it, it, it's still a matter of you, 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 you show up to a horse show grounds and you always are looking around, uh, you know, is, is there another club member? As my grandmother used to say, is there, is there another person of color here? Am I the only one today? And that's a reality. 
facing a lot of people. And I can remember, oh, 40 years ago, trying to get friends of mine to come with me to a horse show. They would say, well, uh, not really. We don't really think that we're wanted there. We don't really feel comfortable there. And this is a reality for a lot of people. Um, three years ago, uh, uh, Dr. Renee King and I uh, wrote an editorial that was, uh, was, was, was published uh, in uh, Horse Nation magazine. And one of the things that we were trying to make a point of is that besides the feel-good aspect of all of this, um, it's really good business. You know, uh, the horse industry has uh, many, many uh, millions and possibly billions of dollars change hands each year. And obviously, if you can expand the base of your audience, uh, everyone in, the, in, in, in that business is going to make more money. It's as simple as that. Uh, yet, that seems to be a very difficult thing for a lot of people to embrace. Uh, so I want to go around the room, get your thoughts on, on, on these topics, and, and really see where people are at in terms of, of what, what, what must be done today, tomorrow, and next year. Marvin, if we can get if we can get your your thoughts on that. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Introduce yourself, my friend. Uh, my name is Marvin Brangman. I'm from Bermuda. I live in uh, Georgia, United States. Uh, uh, I grew up riding. Uh, I started at nine, and uh, just as an activity, my mom asked me if I wanted to go horseback riding, and then. Uh, by the time I was 10, I knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I knew I wanted to train horses. I knew at 10 years old that I was going to train horses. And that's what I do. Uh, and so I ride all day, every day. Uh, my, just like Emily, I grew up at the barn riding everything that was there. So we were walkers, we were show jumpers, we were dressers. We did everything. Uh, we did a little bit of eventing. Bermuda's very small, so it was limited eventing. But we did some of that, mostly hunter jumpers uh, and show jumping and a lot of hunter classes and stuff. And then I moved to America 20 years ago and, uh, and I've been training here, horses here locally. Currently I ride uh, in endurance. Uh, so I ride for Bermuda uh, in, in endurance. Uh, and it's weird because uh, six years ago, I never even knew what endurance was until I met some people <laughs> that do endurance. And then, for those of you that may not know, endurance is um, it's long distance, uh, right races we do 25 50 75 and 100 mile races on arabians and arabian crosses and so i hadn't much experience with arabians until now and in fact i have a newfound respect for them because many of you may know the kind of taboo in dressage <laughs> and so uh uh now i have a newfound respect for them i still do show jumping and i do uh combined training uh it's kind of weird because i have to switch uh, switch saddles and an endurance saddle and I got my dressage saddle and I got my show, my jumping saddle. And so, you know, it's pretty interesting and it's pretty diverse. I do, I just, I even write Western now, but I can't sit in the Western. So I sit English, but I ride in Western because, you know, the, I found out that training, we pretty much, uh, no matter what discipline you're doing, the basics are the same. And I have a very good friend that runs barrels and we've, we've been, talking throughout the years and it's all pretty much the same like as far as uh the mechanics of the horse you know when it comes to training and stuff so it's pretty exciting so that's what i do and i'm pretty excited to that melvin uh reminded me about this conference because uh it's really good for uh for black people to be more recognized uh, as equestrians uh, i mean i remember when i first started they told me that i had natural rhythm you know, and, and they were excited because of the rhythm. You know, we, we all know that when it comes to riding, it's rhythmatic. You know, it's very rhythmatic when it comes to, com you know, kind of connecting with a horse to rhythm. And so this is pretty cool. And I'm, I'm glad for this opportunity to hang out with you all on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Uh, we're going to hear from her a little bit later on the media panel, uh, but I wanted to uh, welcome into the conversation uh, Tori Rapoli, who uh, is a reporter for the Chronicle of the Horse and certainly is one of the bright and upcoming stars in terms of equestrian journalism around the world. Welcome, Tori. Thank you for having me. 
You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, what are you? What are your thoughts on this? On the current status of diversity in the U.S. equestrian community? I mean, it's a hard question to answer. I think what's great about opportunities like this is that we're all trying to figure it out together. Um, I do think that you know, with the diversity councils on now USEF and USHJ, I think we're headed in the right direction. Um, as I you know, focus more on diversity in equestrian sports and learn more about grassroots initi initiatives. I've realized that at the grassroots level, there's a lot more diversity and rich culture. Um, it's just not represented at the elite levels of sports. And obviously that, you know, has a big factor in accessibility from the standpoint of it not being the most affordable sport. So I don't know how to answer that, how to, you know, provide people with opportunity to, you know, purchase horses or take lessons and to maintain um, the commitment that is needed for a sport like this. But I do think that through discussions of this nature and ex people extending opportunities, whether that's, you know, giving someone a writing lesson or allowing someone to volunteer or working student positions, I think that's a good way to grow the sport at the grassroots level. And then hopefully, as time goes on, um, there will be more opportunities and structural changes that can allow for um, long-term growth and progression. Very good. I, I really don't, I have no idea <laughs> the concrete answer because I think for a lot of people who care so much about horses that don't have access to the sports, it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a punch in the stomach, um, you know, not being able to, or wanting to pursue the higher levels and not being able to because of um, finances. But I think as time goes on, we'll figure it out. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, in a moment, we're going to hear from several of our outstanding young juniors uh, in the industry. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to give uh, 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 just a moment uh, to say hello to the person I believe has dialed in from, from absolutely the farthest away, uh, from Southern Africa. Uh, and I'd like to say, uh, just to have, have uh, Gigi Mathias uh, just say a few words of hello to all of us. Gigi, are you there? Yes, I'm there. I'm sorry. I had no to problem. just find the <laughs> unmute button there quickly. Hi, I'm Gigi Mathias. I'm from Namibia. That's the south of Africa, southern part of Africa. I'm also stepping into Mary Binks' shoes, um, taking over her role soon um, as the Group 9 chair. And that is um, being the chairman of 15 African federations that are affiliated to the FEI. Very good. Um, I'm assuming that there are many, many parallels between what is going on here in North America and what you're experiencing in Southern Africa around diversity issues. Diversity in Africa, um, it's, it's sporadic, I would say. Um, if you look at North Africa, it's, it's very well diversified. Uh, it's probably the, there are a few like um, smaller federations because the sport, the, 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 the 15 nations are, most of them are really small. I'm talking membership base between 100 to 400 people. Work is to be done. There's always work necessary. Um, but I think we are already going much further and much better ahead with um, being diversified, especially in the northern parts of Africa. Very good, very good. All right, uh, we're going to move the conversation on. Uh, as I said earlier, it's very important for us to involve young people and for those of us who are a little bit older to listen to the younger people. Uh, we have on the line right now some of the most outstanding young ladies uh, that I know uh, in the horse industry. And um, I, I want to turn the floor over to them. I want to have them each go around and, and introduce themselves and tell us about how they got involved in the horse industry uh, and, you know, where they see, where they see us all going. Um, we're going to start with a young lady that uh, earlier this year, 
uh, really shook up the horse industry here in the United States. Uh, there was an article that was published in the Chronicle of the Horse, uh, and a lot of us who've been around for a minute or two said, right on, you know, it's like, wow. You know, just never believed that you'd be reading in the Chronicle of the Horse or any other uh, mainline publication what was published. But it was a very honest article. It was a very a heartfelt article, and I think it woke a lot of people, myself included, up uh, to what has really been going on in the world. And I want to give uh, Sophie Gotchman uh, all the credit in the world for uh, sort of you know, rocking the boat for, as I said, for a lot of us older folks. Uh, and uh, she and her sister are both with us. Uh, we have uh, two other sisters, uh, Sarah and Emily Harris, who are with us uh, from Sisters Horsing Around. And we also have representatives of the young uh, black equestrian. So I want to go around and have each of you introduce yourself, say hello, and then really uh, turn the floor over to our youth and have them uh, educate us in terms of what's happening today. So we'll start off with Sophie. Uh, we'll go to Sarah and Emily. We'll go then to uh, the young black equestrians. And finally, we'll, we'll uh, f uh, finish with Mimi. So Sophie, uh, what was the, uh, <laughs> what was the, the, uh, really the thing that uh, made you write the wonderful article that you did earlier this year. What, what, uh, what was the thought process behind it? Um, I feel like in the horse world, we kind of have this weird um, pride that like, oh, we're in a little bubble and nothing affects us. And um, it can be like fun to be in the horse world bubble. Uh, but I think it's extremely naive and even ignorant. Uh, to think that issues of race and class and gender uh, don't take any material effects in the horse world. Um, I think that there's extreme inequity. Um, it's like infamously a very white, not diverse sport. Um, there's like a very distinct class issue too. And I was really tired of my peers and the people like the trainers and uh, riders that I look up to um, constantly ignoring all politics, not speaking on the matter. Um, and, you know, I, all my school friends had been discussing the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey. Um, and there was such a stark contrast between uh, what my friends outside the horse world were doing versus what was going on in the horse world online. And I, I think a week after um, we saw his murder on uh, television or social media or whatnot, um, I was just like, okay, like I'm done with giving people excuses for staying silent. Um, and so I just kind of wrote the article in like half an hour. Um, and just like sent it to the Chronicle and was like, please uh, publish this because I think we need to acknowledge this issue. Wow. Well, you're certainly to be applauded. <laughs> certainly to be applauded. Uh, Sarah and Emily, uh, welcome. Can you give us a little bit of a background as, as to what you do? Yes, sir. So we would like to thank Mr. Melvin Cox for giving us this opportunity to be on this panel. And this is a really exciting opportunity. Yes, so yes. I'm Sarah. And I'm Emily Harris from Sisters Horsing Around. We started Sisters Horsing Around, um, which includes Sisters, our YouTube channel and our website and social media accounts. Do you have anything else you want to add? And um, just to give you guys a little background story on Sisters Horsing Around, back when we were younger, um, we were, we were get, our mom, she was having a conversation with us and she told us about how blessed we were to have horses and this is an opportunity that not a lot of people have in the equestrian world and she always told us that whenever we get big is to remember our people and to always provide an opportunity for people in the community of color and I had just a question I was like well why do we have to wait to get big because when she said big I thought she meant older you know famous and I was like we don't really want to wait to do that we want to do it now and so as we got older, we never really forgot that. And then that's when our mom encouraged us to create Sisters Horsing Around in 2018. And so Sisters Horsing Around prov provides, is a horse resource that provides information to both non-equestrians and equestrians alike. 
Outstanding. Outstanding. Thank you. Uh, very, very good. Uh, I see Sandra uh, applauding from London. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> very good. Uh, and, 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 and Caitlin, uh, can you give us a little bit of information about Young Black Equestrians? Is that Abriana with you as well? Yes, it is. <laughs> Wonderful. So happy to have you ladies on, on board today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. We're excited to be here. Um, but our podcast, Young Black Equestrians, started off as just a project we wanted to highlight the passion, culture, and lifestyle of the Black Horse community and just share some of the things that we don't see mainstream. It's turned into a place where we get to pretty much give people their flowers while they're here. We get to share their stories, share their challenges, triumphs, and share any advice that they may have for equestrians all around the world. Um, we have maybe 50, 50 to 60 episodes at this point. We started January of 2000 or February 2019 and we've met so many people on this journey and we're just happy to continue these discussions and um, you know talk with Youssef and be able to have actual actionable you know plans going forward instead of just having discussions and then not getting anywhere. So we're excited to be able to have a true impact on the horse industry um, in more ways than just our podcast. Very good. Very good. Okay. Mimi, uh, uh, a, a champion rider in her own right. Uh, I had a chance to, to meet her uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, and as I said earlier, we've been having some technical problems in the background. Uh, so we had a, a video uh, of Mimi talking about what diversity meant to her. And unfortunately, we're not able to show it at this point due to the technical problems, but it will be up on the website tomorrow. So I'll make sure uh, that everyone that is uh, part of this uh, podcast is able to view her really outstanding and heartfelt remarks about diversity. Uh, and she speaks of the reality of being an Asian American uh, in a world where not too many Asian Americans are seen uh, at a horse show. And so rather than put words in her mouth, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mimi and have her express it. But I do want everyone to see her video uh, when we post it tomorrow. It is truly outstanding and something that we should all, uh, should, should all watch and think about. So Mimi Gotchman, uh, congratulations on some of your recent victories and it's a pleasure to have you on board. Thank you, Melvin. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to do that video and to be on this panel or being a panelist. It's really interesting to meet all these other people and hear from everyone. Um, I'm obviously Sophie's sister and I was kind of blindsided from the lack of diversity in our sport when I was super young. I never really noticed it until the recent events that Sophie spoke about and I think that ever since her article it really opened my eyes and that um, I had never really noticed that I was one of the only people of color in the riding sport world where I am, I, I never really realized that that was really a problem or that there was just such a lack of diversity. So I think that um, her article opened my eyes, um, speaking with Melvin opened my eyes, being more interested and trying to learn more has all been something that I'm working towards. Um, I'm not doing amazing things like podcasts or websites or writing articles, but I'm trying to learn from all these people and see what I can do and just, um, yeah, learn more and try to work towards being more active in the, in the um, fight for more diverse sport. So that's kind of what I'm up to. Fantastic. Uh, let me just throw it out to all of our uh, youth panelists, uh, the question as to what are the things that uh, us older people can do to help you on your journey? I mean, obviously, uh, all of you, uh, all, all six of you uh, have taken, to taken strides that uh, a lot of people who came before never had an opportunity to take. Uh, and I think it's our responsibility as the mothers, fathers, you know, uncles, aunts, godfathers, godmothers, etc., uh, to help all of you on your journeys uh, and to make sure that you get uh, ahead. I mean, we live in a very selfish world. 
And I think one of the things that older people can do is realize, hey, I've run my race, you know, and it's time now to hand the baton off to that next generation and, and be there to cheer as you run around the race. And hopefully uh, at some point your generation will hand, hand that baton off as well. So uh, can you tell us what, what are the things that are necessary? What are the things that are on your mind these days as we talk about diversity in the equestrian sports? Um, I felt like, uh, from my experience after I wrote the article, I definitely got, um, a lot of criticism from the old guard. I think that, um, like diversity or lack of diversity, uh, it's a systemic issue in the U.S. And I think that when we have discussions about it, it's important to like, not get defensive. I think we're all guilty of doing that. Um, but to understand that, like, just because we're young, um, we've like done our research, we've had our experiences, and we can still form intelligent opinions that are worthy of being heard. Um, and that um, if you criticize an aspect of the sport, it doesn't necessarily mean that, like, I'm called or we're calling someone racist or I'm calling someone racist or whatnot. Um, it's just something that I think that is an issue in like America in general and in the world and that the horse world is just a byproduct of that. Next. I think one of the main ways that older people can help in, um, you know, kind of amplifying young voices for lack of better terms is or kind of to just get more people in the horse industry I think it's important to understand kind of what your position is and how it can actually help us because I feel like you know a lot of people like older people are on these boards on these board of directors on you know these large governing organizations that have access to funds that we don't know anything about so accessibility in the horse industry is largely surrounded surrounds like economic accessibility so i think that older people can provide resources and access to funds that will allow people that are younger may not even just be younger but have innovative ideas to actually implement them and cause the change that they're seeking mm -hmm. and can you speak about some of the specific changes that you'd like to see yeah um we would like to see more programs that target trying to get people that are not in the horse industry in the industry um it's kind of like the focus is now on competing and you know being professionals and if you look at the industry like a triangle like the base is getting smaller mm -hmm. it's the elitist at the top that like that's who gets the focus and that's who gets the the notoriety and the media attention and the money so having programs put into place that focus on the base of the industry it allows it to grow to that that top instead of point it upside down, you put a triangle upside down, it's not going to balance very well. Exactly. Uh, Sarah and Emily, what are your thoughts? All right, so we would say that building relationships is something that is would be <coughs> very helpful and really good. It's because we've met so many different people in our journey in, into the equestrian life, and the relationships that we have built have been so impactful in our lives. <coughs> and, if, um, and this doesn't have to be just limited to older people. It could be anyone who is in the horse world, whether or not you are a professional, whether you're a rider, anyone, an owner, a horse trainer. If you can build relationships with people who are non equestrians or people who don't have access to the same things that you do, it can go, it, it would be very appreciated and can go very far. Um, I think one thing that would be very good is engagement from older people, um, seniors to youth. Um, I think um, that um, youth can you learn a lot from them because they have been through this and they know they know in their experience. So I think youth can definitely learn from 
you know, people who have been there, done that, and that's definitely, I think that what we need is engagement from them. Mimi? Something a lot, they all kind of touched on points that I thought of, but something just to add is, um, I think that the older people in our sport could always lead with example. I think, yes, listening to the youth is a very good, um, it's a good job, like Sophie's article, reading it and trying not to be defensive about it, which she touched on, but then also reading it, understanding it, maybe learning from it, and then trying to extend it and become examples because there are so many like trainers, professionals, judges, um, management, high people in high management that a lot of kids look up to that might not know as much. And if they could write stuff like Sophie did or start websites or be really proactive about it. Um, I think it would open a lot of people's minds that look up to them because they have that power and that status in our sports. And I think that seeing other people that are older and that everyone looks up to um, open their minds and try to be active and change things would be really interesting and would help a lot. Very good. We have a, a comment uh, uh, in, in the chat that I wanted to share with the group. Uh, this is from Dolores Montgomery, addressed to all of the panelists. And her comment is, the prior generations need to address inclusion as actively as they ignored uh, exclusion. The prior generations need to address inclusion as actively as they ignored exclusion. Anyone want to pick up on that? That kind of speaks for itself, I would think. Michael, from where, from where you sit, um, how does what you're hearing from our youngsters uh, impact how you are going about planning, uh, let's say, activities over the next two, three, four years? I think they're very inspiring and I think uh, Sophie's article uh, certainly rocked the boat big time at the, at the elite level. And it was about time it was rocked. I mean, you know, call a spade a spade. There is inherent racism in the um, horse world. They don't admit it, but it's there. All you have to do is, Sophie said, hang around the uh, in gate to hear the sort of attitudes um, that are there. And, you know, we have one African-American um, in gate guy and he's held up as though we're being super inclusive. I mean, it's nonsense. And I think what needs to happen is, um, part of the problem with the industry, it, it's, it is an industry and a very expensive industry. So the access point, not just for, for people of color, but for people with uh, low incomes, it's very, very hard to get into it because it's just so expensive. And there's been no real effort made by, um, the governing bodies, um, the national governing bodies. The FEI has done a lot over the years to try and make, make changes, but they always have to deal with the national governing body. And that's always, the, that's always a problem. So I believe that there should be programs to, to not just um, people of color, but, but uh, people with low incomes, get them into the sport at different levels so that you can see that, you, that your peers or people like you are competing. What you said earlier, Melvin, about you go to a horse show and you're looking around to see if there's somebody in your club is there. <laughs> well, yes. you know, if there are more people from your club competing or um, working in the horse show office or um, judging or whatever, you feel that you could be included. And I think that's part of the, the difficulty you know, uh, a young African-American uh, kid comes to the horse show, she doesn't see anybody. I mean, maybe one or two people showing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they're quite often very, very wealthy because that's how they're there. There's not too many uh, poor, there's not too many poor people in general horse showing. Um, but I think if we as an organization and uh, United States Equestrian Federation and other national federations around the world started to work on programs to um, go into schools to say, look, there are opportunities 
for um, for business. It's a it's an industry. You can make a very good living being a horse show manager or a barn manager. You don't have to be an elite rider to to be successful. And I think if we do, we've tried it a couple of times in Wellington, and we could never really get buy-in too much from the schools. But we're gonna we're gonna keep trying, um, and we need to do more. We haven't done enough. That's hundred patently obvious. But um, I think everybody now with the, you know, all the recent political events have shown us that we have to do something. And, you know, I'm probably the oldest person on the panel. And um, so the gray and ancient, uh, but, you know, if I can um, get my head around it, surely everybody can get their head around it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Sandra, uh, I'd like to call on you from your perspective, uh, both as a black equestrian uh, in the UK, uh, but more importantly, as as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, as someone who is uh, making her living in the horse in the horse industry now. Uh, picking up on what Michael just said, uh, what wisdom can you can you lend to our youngsters? Oh well, basically, I mean, I've been in the industry for fifty years. Uh, I started riding myself when I was three three years old. And my daughter as well, I've gone through the ranks as such, and so has my daughter. Uh, my daughter was the youngest bane rider in the UK, age 12, doing BE90, uh, and riding against adults um, on her pony. So there wasn't pony trials when she was in 2008, so she rode against adults on her pony. And so, um, but she dropped off, she dropped into the pit. She, uh, there was no, she got so much systemic racism that one day she just said to me, Mum, I can't do it anymore. I've given mm. up, I'm given up. Which was so sad because I had a yard full of horses. We've been working constantly since she was three years old. You know, she, she, she packed it in. She just said, I, I, what do I have to do, Mum? What do I have to do to show these people that I'm good? You know, you know, she was the best rider in the county. She was an elite rider at her age at 15. She just gave up. So it's such a sad thing. Um, so when all this happened, when all the George Floyd happened, it actually gave me a voice because I was sick of it. I was sick of having to put up with all of the racism she was facing, all the racism I faced as well when I went through it because I was the only black rider in the Royal Air Force for 12 years. Mm. And, you know, and the racism that I got was just ridiculous. But I just pushed through because horses are my life. So, you know, they were given to me like they're given to everybody else. And so, you know, I never let that get to me as such. But what I can say to these young guys out there is just keep going because, you know, you, you, you don't have to prove you're good. You are good. Yeah. It's the fact that people are jealous of the way you are. And that's why they are so anti what you do, because you, they, they don't want to be underneath you they want to be above you and if you're good you're up there they just want to pull you down so just don't let them make you feel that you're not good enough you are too good that's that's the difference you are too good so you have to keep going and progression for me for, for, is the main thing young people in say in the UK I'm not sure about how the America you know how it works in the US but in the UK especially young black people are very much in a city, very much, um, you know, they're not country, they're not in the country. So that's where we have an issue. We have uh, um, black people and bane people being introduced to horses um, at a young age in the inner city, but their parents, they, they don't live in the countryside, so there's no progression. You have to have the facilities, you have to have the infrastructure, and you have to have the ponies or the horses to ride. Uh, and when you've got no no progression then you lose the talent you lose the the, the ability to get these people in into the sport and um, i'm going to talk a bit a little bit later about how i'm hoping to change that in the uk um but like i say we you know i, I have been you know in in the, the horse and hound which is our biggest publication <laughs> um, i love it <laughs> yeah <laughs> and that was that was in october this one was in october and this one, this one here is um, November. This is this week. This is this week's horse and hound. So I'm, I'm absolutely, I'm just in it all the time. You know, you know, I'm, I'm making a, a stand all the time and, and showing a presence all the time to young people that read this, this magazine, which is the biggest in the UK. We're here all the time. 
You know, it's about it's about black people, it's about vain people, it's about progression, it's about how we can we can inspire people, it's about how we can inspire young black people in the business, not just horse riding and, and sport, but in business as well. So I'm I'm just making an impact all the time and I think this is what young people need to see. They need to see this sort of article in, in these types of magazines. So that's that's all I'm gonna I can talk for England, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Mia, 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 what are your thoughts on, on all of this? Yeah, um, I just wanted to piggyback onto what um, Michael and Sandra said about uh, the sort of exclusivity of horse sports as a whole. Dressage is a hotbed for that sort of thing. Um, you know, I think we all needed to hear what Sandra said, is that we are good enough, regardless of what people say. I'd like to think that, you know, we're so good that, that we're in we're intimidating to them but I think the reality of the situation is that you know it's designed for people like us to fail and it's not designed for people like us to ever win or ever feel like we succeeded or ever feel like we have a real foot in the door a real say a real anything and you know it's the same thing with me I uh, went to an international competition in Wellington and coming from California to Wellington, the amount of racist experiences I had in Wellington, in and out of, you know, the, the showgrounds and just in my everyday walking about sort of life, I had to end up carrying pepper spray and a taser because I had a terrifying, in, uh, you know, incident with some Nazis in a parking lot at my hotel. Um, you know, and then you, when you carry that over and go to an international show and then it goes from explicit racism to implicit racism, where you can't quite pinpoint what it is that they're saying, this like microaggressive mm -hmm. sort of behavior combined with the fact that, you know, as a person of color, as somebody with a disability, as someone, you know, from an immigrant family, upward social mobility is essentially a myth. You know, there's all these stories about people, they say, oh, you know, Steve Jobs started in a garage or, you know, something like that. Now he's a, was a billionaire. Um, I think that's sort of a toxic narrative to have and say, oh, well, if you, uh, just got a better job or if you did this that or whatever I think you would be more financially responsible when the reality is when there's no opportunity in horse sports in dressage in life for upward social mobility um, I don't know how anyone is expected to be able to afford to go to shows to be able to stay on the roster and even considered like an active athlete when I was thinking about you know obviously my dreams are the same as everybody else's to make it to the Paralympics make it to the Olympics one of the criteria, the fine print on the application for that is um, financials. So you have to be financially able to do like regular shows, regular competitions, all of these things that are just completely impossible for me. If I can go to a couple shows a year, it's a miracle. And then I don't eat for like a month. And I feel like there's not enough programs set up, like you were saying, for, you know, people of color, people with, you know, the world, the deck stacked against them for, people to succeed it just kind of feels like crap to be set up to fail but then it feels really damn good when you do succeed mm -hmm. but you know we shouldn't have to fight that hard <laughs> can, I, can, I, can i just um say that we actually have the ceo of british dressage on our group we actually awesome have on our group that's and awesome this is what we need to I was going to explain this is what we need to be doing is getting these top people in a, in a group or on a round table and saying, what are you going to do? What exactly, exactly are you going to do? Yeah, because yeah. it does, it feels like it's a lot of talk. It's not yeah. always action. Like um, what Ms. Swift was saying about this amazing program, grant opportunities. I am so excited about that. And I, I like, it can't come soon enough, but I feel like this should have been around this entire time. It should have been you know, it's, it's like affirmative action adjacent, but just, you know, don't stack the deck against us. It's sort of, you know, the way I think of it is each layer of marginalization that you have, it's like somebody put a brick in a backpack you're carrying. So, you know, you're disabled, there's a brick, you're a person of color, there's a brick, you're a woman, there's a brick, you're low income, there's a brick. And then, you know, when you're climbing up a mountain with a backpack full of bricks, and then, you know, somebody next to you is floating on air, never seen a brick in their entire life, doesn't have a backpack, then yeah, of course it makes you stronger, but nobody should have to climb up a mountain with a backpack full of bricks when everybody else is floating up the mountain on a donkey or something. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, earlier this year, we did a video about 
racial diversity and the equestrian community. And some of the things that we talked about was empathy and understanding from people, other pe other equestrians to people of color and um, BIPOC and all of that. And we talked about exposure and engagement and representation, which um, it was really great to hear about the, um, the presentation about the International Museum of the Horse and what they are doing because we definitely need the histories. Um, all, all equestrian history brought more to, um, to the forefront so that people know and the things that we were um, that we have talked about with ourselves is definitely that what, what riders uh, whether you're a low-income family, a new kid wanting to learn how to ride, what they need is, what they want is an opportunity to ride. And support. <laughs> yeah. And support. That's what they want. I mean, when we first started, we wanted the opportunity to ride. Right you're now, we're still looking. looking for an opportunity to ride. That's just something that um, young people and just anyone who wants to get into horses wants want to do. And so um, definitely building relationships whether you're a trainer or, or a judge or a rider or um, a horse owner, building relationship with those pe with people um, in the BIPOC uh, communities is definitely helpful. And also um, access to facilities um, for people. I mean, in our area, it was hard for us to figure out where, when we first started, it was hard finding out where to go. I mean, someone yeah. asked a question about that in some of the um, the Q and A talks about how does it, how does a non equestrian get into equestrian sport and that sort of thing, and we we like had to dig and search to get to where we are today because that information there's a gap between equestrians and non equestrians, and that's what we wanted to do with Sisters Horse Around was to bridge that gap in information. And a lot of things what I've noticed about that information is that it, a lot of the information is passed through generation to generation by word of mouth. A yeah. lot of this, if, if you have a parent or a friend that is a horse trainer, you want to get into horses, you go to that friend. But if you have nobody who is in horses, what do you do? And yeah. definitely find, um, finding the materials to learn can be hard and daunting, especially when you want good, solid information that you don't have to keep relearning and having to to. to to um, having to go back and be like, wait a minute, that information was wrong. This is the right information. And so definitely finally finding good solid information is really hard to find. And so that's yeah. having that information there for others to find easily is definitely something that we need in the sport. Yeah, and like what you said about the accessibility, for some perspective, I drive twice a week, a five hour round trip just to be able to get to a barn. Literally, that's 10 hours minimum a week that I drive just to be able to ride a horse. This is so absurd to me. And it comes down to a myriad of systemic issues. The first one being, you know, I'm a disabled rider. I cannot tell you how many places I've been and this is just like the bare minimum. How many places I've been, they say, you're not allowed on the property. You're a liability. Don't come here. We don't want you. Don't, you know, just don't contact us ever again. I have, I live in Lompoc, California, which is like, you know, the, the projects adjacent of an hour north of Santa Barbara. So I have called every single barn north of Paso Robles, down south past LA, and I have one barn that finally decided to take me in Newberry Park, and it's, you know, like a specific paradressage um, center of excellence called Ride On Therapeutic Horsemanship, and I called dozens and dozens of places. Nobody would let me ride there. They said, you know, it doesn't matter if you sign a waiver, you're still a liability, and it's just this closed-minded, ridiculous attitude when they have more of a liability of, you know, discrimination lawsuit than they do of you know, people fall off horses. That's, you know, that's, that's how the world works. And yeah, yeah. so I, I, twice a week, I do this five hour round trip and it, it feels daunting. The fact that, you know, all of my peers, they either own their own horses or they lease their own horses or something and something I could never even imagine affording to be able to do. So they ride seven days a week when I'm riding maximum of two days a week, if I'm lucky, usually one day a week, it's like, I take seven times longer to to learn the same stuff that they do, to be able to compete at the same level that they do, just, you know, throwing my money at this problem and it, it feels pretty futile sometimes. Uh, we're gonna, uh, go, go ahead. I feel like the sentiment um, from the 
all three of you ladies that you've spoke about is the fact that I guess if the ultimate goal is to get people of color into the arena, into the competition ring, then it needs to be addressed at the bottom. Like you don't grab com competitors off the street, like they're groomed from someone who is just like, hey, I ca I'm kind of interested in horses to let me start taking lessons, to let me start going to shows with my lesson barn. Like it's like an entire grooming process. And that happens for not only competitors, but people who are interested in being farriers, people who are interested in being show managers or in any aspect of the industry. So I feel like if your ultimate goal is trying to get more people of color into the show world, you can't start by looking at the show world. Right. You have to look outside of that and you have to, you know, support these places who are trying to get kids in there and get, you know, people who, you know, like Sarah and Emily are not normally in the horse industry. I say that, but I also caution because, you know, especially with the, the events of this summer, um, it's not preferred to have some sort of white savior swoop down and, you know, grab these, you know, kids of color and, you know, teach them. You, you have to make connections with people and you have to actually be really invested in success outside of the horse industry for people to trust you and allow you to, you know, have that kind of connection. Like you said, with schools in Wellington, you know, there, there, there needs to be a little bit more of, um, you know, a connection and, and a real, real like holistic influence because without life outside of horses, we wouldn't be able to have life with horses. Right. So I just want to, because it seems like that's kind of what the overall consensus is, is you got to start at the bottom and that's where funds, access, mentorship, pipeline programs, that's where all of that can start to take place. Wow. Uh, I guess this is, is, is probably a good place as any to, to begin wrapping up this. Uh, we have some fabulous, fabulous youth uh, coming through the pipeline. And I, I, I know that uh, many of the students I work with at the university and many of the young people I meet in the community uh, just leave me uh, astounded as to the, the potential uh, that's coming down uh, uh, in, in, into our society. So uh, I want to thank uh, all of our, our panelists on the youth panel for their contributions. This has been a very, very valuable discussion, and I hope we can do it again. I, just, I certainly hope that we can do this again and, uh, you know, follow your journeys uh, as you go through the industry. Uh, all six, or actually seven uh, of the young women that have spoken are people that we want to keep track of. Okay, uh, our next panel, and we have scheduled a, a, a short break, but I think we're going to pass on the break just simply in the, in, in the uh, matter of time. We've got so many things to discuss, and I want to make sure that everyone has time to, uh, to tell their truth, to tell their story. So our next panel is going to be uh, the media panel. And uh, we have some, some of America's very best equine journalists on board. And uh, it, it is good to see a number of, of, of old friends aboard as, as well as some new friends. So we want to go ahead and, and, and prepare for our media panel. Um, if anyone has anything to say to follow the youth panel, let's do that. And then we'll start with the media panel in about three minutes. Anyone want to, any final thoughts on the youth panel? Tori, uh, what are your thoughts? I'm just inspired listening to these, you know, very well-spoken individuals who I think, you know, everything they said, I agree with their sentiments. And it's very important to, you know, start from the bottom and just embrace the people who are there and, you know, the rich culture that is already there, the diversity that's already there, the people who are just as passionate as everyone else, but don't have necessarily the leg up to get to, you know, the higher levels of sports. Um, and in, I think back to the talking point of, you know, what the elders in our community can do when the more senior, you know, the trainers and the, um, you know, the big barns and things like that. So I remember when Sophie wrote her piece and I think just hearing some of the perspectives from, you know, some of the people who wrote in 
to the Chronicle concerned, you know, why did we give her the, the platform to speak and, and to express herself in the way she did? I just, I think it was honestly disgusting. Some of the, you know, the perspectives that were shared and just a lack of compassion and understanding and respect for someone who said nothing wrong and who is trying to champion um, inclusivity for an entire industry of people. But I think, you know, everyone, I really hope that people, you know, even if they're not able to watch right now, will really go back and watch the dialogue that's happening um, in this seminar because I think it's really important and can set the foundation for progress going forward. Very good. All right. Thank you. That was a very enlightening, enlightening panel. Uh, our next panel is going to concern the media. And uh, we've taken the liberty of inviting uh, an international uh, group of media people, uh, writers, uh, authors uh, of, of books, uh, journalists, uh, as well as uh, Julian Seaman, uh, the former uh, media press officer uh, for the badminton horse trials. Uh, I almost want to call it the Mitsubishi Motors, but I realize it's no longer the Mitsubishi Motors badminton horse trials. Uh, it still is in my mind. Uh, the person that is going to direct uh, the discussion on this is Leslie Wiley uh, of Eventing Nation uh, magazine. Uh, Leslie has kindly agreed to direct the discussion on, of our media panel. Uh, and we will be introducing uh, various people uh, on that panel. Uh, Leslie, are you online? I can hear her in the background. She's actually here and trying. I can hear her in the background. Uh, I, I don't see her online yet. Um, okay. Uh, let's go ahead and introduce the other members of the panel. Uh, Martha Drum. Uh, Elizabeth K. McCall. Hello. Okay. Uh, Tori Rapola, we've met. Uh, Julian Seaman and Sally Sprickard. Martha, would you like to uh, sh share a few of your thoughts? We'll go to Martha well, just, and Elizabeth you first. Me. Yes. Yeah. Um, no, I'm just thrilled that you uh, invited me here and I'm having a fantastic time really listening and learning to all of these. Um, people who are interested in connecting more human beings with horses. Uh, and I, I really feel that um, a lot of what Ms. Gooch was saying about accessibility and about that triangle being balanced the wrong way, about needing to build up the base of the horse world um, is so, so important. And to get people who don't have access, who don't have that aunt or a friend who's a trainer that they can reach out to get them near horses where they can fall in love with horses and then really focusing on how can we enable them to get to horses, become regular participants in horse activities, and then we can go on and build up whether they're going to compete or going to a career with horses. So uh, there's some fantastic ideas that people are sharing about how to do that and how to make more of the population truly welcome, feeling welcome, truly welcome, and contributing going forward. Absolutely. Elizabeth, your thoughts? Try it again. Am I, <laughs> am I here now? Hello, Melvin. Hello. <laughs> uh, I've had the good fortune of knowing Melvin since 2004. And um, a lot of the topics that have been covered so far, we've discussed from time to time. And it's really a treat to see what he's doing. I met Melvin when I was working for Cavalia, which was an international equestrian spectacle. And it was right when it first came to the United States. And a lot of the things that people are talking about today, uh, just in terms of new people getting interested in horses or horse sports um, are certainly something that Cavalia, it reached to millions of people. We try so hard to interest people in horses. I have a particular interest in horses and film and entertainment, live entertainment. Melvin got some of the best interviews ever of the cast that we had uh, when that show started. And we did have some diversity in the cast, which was nice. And that's the good thing about, I think horses can bring people together in a lot of ways. Uh, I won't go on too, too long right now, but um, I've got some real cool stuff. I got a, I recently did a story on a couple of stories on the new movie, Black Beauty, that's a remake 
and a little different by a young lady, 33 years old, who is a writer, director, and even edited the film. Uh, and that has, um, certainly she sent some information just this morning to me about a black actor in the cast that I just became aware of. I was focused on the horse trainer and the, and the director and the stories that I wrote and the producer. But I think film can also take things to a big stage and then we can pick up the, pick up the baton from there and then go on and say, you like the horses, you know, let's tell you more about it. And any, no matter who's in it, any sport, any discipline, uh, find ways we can reach people through film and entertainment. Very good. Uh, Sally, welcome. Hi, how are you? Fine. Uh, can you uh, uh, introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about what it is that you do? Sure. Um, so I uh, am one of the editors for part uh, Eventing Nation. I got started with them uh, about seven years ago and kind of worked my way up and have been working with Leslie Wiley for several years now. So we've become a, a team of sorts. Um, also have freelanced for other publications such as Noel Floyd and Heels Down Magazine. So uh, try to spread out my, my network as much as I can. And it's really an honor to be here. Very good. Uh, Tori, we've uh, heard a little bit from you, but can you tell us a little bit more about your uh, side as a journalist? Sure. So my name is Tori Repol. I work for the Chronicle of the Horse magazine. I got my start in horses relatively late in life. I didn't grow up around them. I was born in Jamaica, moved to the United States when I was seven years old. And in high school, I volunteered with the horses for the handicap program, which would eventually lead to my work at a dressage barn. And during that time, I took pictures of horses and wrote about them and then started freelancing, um, got into the industry through Noel Floyd there for about a year and then started working with the Chronicle in 2018. But um, I think at the Chronicle as a journalist, I, you know, I predominantly write stories and, um, you know, do interviews. And I think um, post Sophie Gotchman's piece, you know, internally, I think we looked at what we could be doing more and how we can further dis the discussion through the work that we do. And so that's kind of working on some special stories at the moment right now, but that's, that's where I'm at. Oh, very good. Julian, tell us a little bit about your, your work. Is Julian here yet? He's here. He's he's okay. uh, needs to be unmiked, unmuted. Julian, you need to unmute yourself. There we go. There you <laughs> go. All right, we're good. Good, good. Yes, my history. Um, yes. Many, many moons ago, um, I was a rider at Babington and Burley, um, and then a little bit of a gap between, and then I was the media director there for. 18 years and I've just retired because I'm a very old man now. So I'm now doing lots of writing now. Very good. <laughs> and last but certainly not least is our discussion director for this panel, uh, Leslie Wiley from Eventing Nation magazine. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Melvin, for bringing all these important conversations back to the forefront for a second. You're in a row here, and um, and thanks to our, our hosts here at Tryon International Equestrian Center, um, and um, to all of our panelists and to everyone who's tuning in from home um, to you. Um, and I'm very honored to be back again this year because last year was such a, a very positive and constructive experience and one that I've carried with me um, ever since. So um, really exciting. Um, I know some of our, uh, our uh, panelists have, have already introduced themselves, um, but just to um, add, add to it, um, I think they, you know, we all represent media, but um, from various corners of it. Um, we've got uh, Julian, who's worn so many hats. Um, he's an author, he's a broadcaster, he's a lecturer, he was a uh, venue media manager for the London Olympics, um, and he recently retired um, from his role, long-time role as a press officer at badminton and actually competed at badminton himself um, a few moons ago. Um, but um, last year, um, Julian shared some really um, really thoughtful insights about um, the question of how do we connect the sport with and market it to 
um, the greater public, which is obviously important if we want it to be considered relevant and viable going forward in the future, and race um, certainly plays a big role in that. Um, so always interested to hear what Julian has to say. Um, Elizabeth, um, you, she's, she's another one, uh, played many roles, author, journalist, media consultant. Um, she's worked in the entertainment side of the horse industry for 20 years and in TV and film um, and, uh, and like the, the French theater, equestrian theater uh, troupe Zingaro and um, like she said, she worked for Cavalia. And again, that's, an, you know, she's another person who's, how do I take this, this um, sort of niche thing that is horses and connect it to um, a broader audience? And um, one of her books, um, The Tale of Horses, um, actually, I read that, um, Elizabeth, probably 15 years ago when it first came out. And um, it talks a lot about the transformative power of horses, um, which of course transcends the color of our skin. Um, um, Martha, um, she, she's from Virginia. We're from all over the place too, LA, um, uh, San Diego, Virginia. Um, um, Martha lives in Virginia and uh, ran her own um, intro level riding program for 16 years. Um, and one thing she had, she had told me that I found really fascinating was that um, she um, was her experience of trying to attract families to horse sport in a rural uh, county that was 50% white and 40% uh, 46 black. Um, that's really important, important work. And again, we're just, um, you know, just another expansion of the theme of how do we connect, how do we connect, how do we connect to um, a larger audience and in the broader world. Um, Martha, um, a couple years ago, transitioned to writing full time and um, up until recently worked at the Chronicle of the Horse with um, Tori, actually, who's who um, is here also with us today. And the um, Chronicle's done some really magnificent work. They've they never shy away from um, issues, uh, even tough, tough issues, um, you know, like like talking about race this year and um, and I think it's, it's, they just tackled safe sport um, beautifully before that. And so we're, you know, I'm really proud of our sport that we're asking some hard questions of ourselves and really looking ourselves in the mirror now. And the Chronicles um, played a huge role in facilitate, facilitating those, those conversations. Um, so, um, and then, and also we've got um, Sally, um, who's been with Ian since 2014, and I could not do it without her. Um, she has been hugely influential in shaping our own diversity inclusion initiatives. And um, like she said, she's or sh she's on the steering committee, um, which I'd love for her to tell you more about this, of a brand new allyship program um, for equestrian sports called um, Strides for Equality Equestrians, um, which just launched this past week. So that's really exciting. Um, so anyway, we, we represent all of which to say, and I'll turn it over to, to, to you guys, um, but we represent a, a really broad swath of media, um, you know, but the thing that I think underscores all of our roles is that we are, um, but we are communicators. That's our job is to communicate. Um, it's a job and an honor, I, 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 if you ask me, um, to communicate the narrative of our sport, both within our community and to the broader public. And um, I think that takes a lot of listening to figure out what that narrative is. And, and that's, um, and to everyone here today, we're all listening very hard and, um, and thinking about what we want the narrative of our sport to be. Um, you know, it's a, it's a big responsibility, um, media, um, you, what stories get told, what words do we choose when we tell them? Um, or on the flip side of that, um, what church, what words do we choose to not use, um, which can certainly carry a lot of um, weight to, um, to just the elephant in the room. <laughs> um, the website, our website, Vending Nation, got a really close up 
look at this um, recently when we decided to not use a word that we had learned was hurtful and troubling to um, many people in our sport. So, you know, words aren't just words. They, they carry incredible weight and they empower and they need to be used responsibly. So, um, you know, I think that in the story that we've historically been telling about our sport is one of whiteness. And I think um, we all agree that that needs to change. It's time to shine the spotlight on on a more div diverse uh, chorus of voices, so that we, when when um, people look at our sports, you know, if, if non-white people look at our sport and don't see themselves, um, I think that can be really, really discouraging. So, um, so, so with that, I'd like to sort of you know open the floor um, to you guys to um, talk about. Um, our responsibility in acknowledging and em embracing diversity. Sorry, well, I kind of went on and on there, but <laughs> you guys take it now. <laughs> uh, Sally, I can go ahead and chime in. <laughs> yes, please do. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think um, in the recent months, for me personally, it's been a lot of introspection, and I think a lot of us can say the same thing. Um, just as a little bit of background about me and not to make it about me, but just to provide context. Um, I was adopted when I was about three months old. And so I grew up in a very white neighborhood, a very white family. And for the longest time, spent so much time denying the fact that I was Asian and looked different. Um, I think I was 28 the first time I ate Korean food. I never learned the language. Um, so it was easier for me to say, oh, I'm just going to distance myself from every other Asian person that I come across and therefore I can feel more comfortable because I don't feel like I stick out so much. So that was about the first 30 years of my life, honestly. And, you know, over time, as I got older, I started to understand that there was a whole other identity of myself that was missing. And so this last few months of introspection has been hard because I can, I can feel myself wanting to cling to some of the more conservative white Midwestern ideals that had been instilled in me from the way I was raised. And that started to really be a conflict for me because I, I could feel myself pushing against the way I was thinking and the way I was knee jerking to everything. So I really want to under, wanted to understand, um, you know, predominantly for my black friends and acquaintances and colleagues, what the experience is as a black American, because I, I can't relate to that. And I can't, I can't pretend to say that I fully understand. And so my thing was, you know, how do I understand myself and how I look at the world? And then how do I then tell the stories of more people who don't see themselves represented? Um, so for me, the manifestation of that has been to write as many stories and tell as many stories of writers of color from diverse backgrounds or programs that are trying to further diversification in our industry. Um, because I think back to my little 12 year old self on the first beginnings of the internet, trying to find a picture of somebody that wasn't white on a horse, an Asian girl on a horse, I was impossible. Uh, and that, that has always stuck with me. Um, I think a lot of people feel that once they are in the sport, it's very welcoming and you have a great experience and you find a barn family and it's hard for people to understand how horse sports could be exclusive in any way when you're in it. But the fact is when you don't see yourself represented in stories or advertising or um, in your peers, it, it starts to really be noticeable in an uncomfortable way. So, you know, as media members, I think we have a responsibility to give the microphone to as many people that don't resemble us as possible. I mean, we have such a diverse group of people and it's been really encouraging for me to learn as much as I can and talk to as many people as I can to understand as much of their experience and then be able to relate and tell that story to other people. Um, so that's kind of been the challenge, I guess, that I've given myself. Mm -hmm. I completely agree um, with everything you said. And I mean, when it comes to representation, it's interesting because as a minority, when you grow up in a predominantly white space, it's very easy to try and disassociate from who you are and try to kind of morph into herd mentality. And, you know, even when I was growing up, I, you know, I was ashamed of being black because that's just not was that's just not what was favorable. Um, you know, it wasn't celebrated. It wasn't it wasn't welcomed. It wasn't deemed as successful or beautiful. So I think 
when it comes to media and the way we handle stories, I think it's very important to be mindful that there are people, there are different types of people in this industry. They might not be at, you know, the elite levels that we cover, but they're there and they deserve, you know, they deserve to be acknowledged and recognized and celebrated for their accomplishments that are of equal magnitude as everyone else, you know, and that's something I've learned. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, when we, at the Chronicle after Sophie published her piece and there was this, you know, incredible dialogue that sparked um, both good and bad. I think we looked inward and said, you know, we could be doing a lot more. And, you know, there are people that are, people of color that are competing and that, you know, contribute to this sport uh, that are not recognized and we're not writing about them. And I think one thing that I'm kind of sitting with right now is as I'm writing about people of color, you know, whenever I write a story, I want people to really realize how special they are and how deserving they are. And one thing that I kind of contemplate is, you know, I don't want to, I don't always want to include the fact that, you know, this person's black and these are the experiences they've dealt with because can they just, you know, be written about without pointing out the elephant in the room, but in the same breath, I think as, you know, the conversation picks up and this is, this is a topic that people pay more attention to. Um, it's necessary, you know, not necessarily pushing, pushing a narrative, but just allowing someone to tell their story. And that might include the fact that they didn't feel welcomed in this industry. But I think hopefully as we go further and we progress, that's not something we'll have to talk about. You know, there'll be a day where we can just acknowledge someone's accomplishments and their plight in the sport without pointing out that they're an anomaly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes, Elizabeth. Okay, I have some comments. I started out as a journalist, as a freelance journalist, and um, I, I wrote for the Chronicle, actually. One of the editors said, you know, you're not gonna make it unless you can tell at least three versions of a story. And I know if we're talking about trying to get stories in the media, you gotta figure out how you can pitch something. And if you're a good publicist, it's the same thing. If you're a freelance journalist, you have to be able to do exactly what a good, <laughs> a good publicist will do in terms of interesting a publisher or another member of the media in the story, no matter what it's about. And then you have to be able to write it or broadcast it. But uh, what I found is, you know, a lot of times when you're telling a story, there's so many ways now, um, you know, I've got a PR client and I jump the fence when I need to. I go both sides and sometimes I'm a publicist and sometimes I'm a journalist. But I found that this one client of mine who was, public, who was, a, was a PR client, I've turned him into a media personality because he's gone into YouTube and he's gone into doing Facebook videos. Uh, I thought he had a show for him last year before COVID. There wasn't there. We turned the other way and pivoted. And I see, you know, all these young ladies, uh, these young equestrians and people with a, that are already jumping into all the YouTube with their own shows, you've got a chance to do a good show, you know. You can make it something, and if you've got the, you know, the followers and things, you can make an impact, you know. You can take, you know, the lead from a lot of professionals here. They can help you make your story better, and no matter who the story is about, if it's a good story, it can get picked up. And once these things get trending, you know, you know, Google alerts then tells somebody else what's going on. Uh, I think there's some tremendous opportunities here. In fact, it's like, my gosh, I'd like to talk to some of these younger, you know, the, the YouTube sisters. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm Sarah and Emily. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking, this is great. I mean, I'm seeing the potential here. It took me, I don't, I'm not really active on social media, honestly. I just assume people not know everything I'm doing. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, you know, there, we've got opportunities here to tell a lot of good stories, but it's, if you're the freelancer though, and you're trying to get something in the reality of publishers now is their budgets are cut. I had one that I was supposed to do about five or six stories for this year. That was Cowboys and Indians I write for sometimes, you know, and the only thing that went forward was the black beauty story. And it's just that when you're trying to say, why isn't it in the media? Some of it's just that the publishers can't find a way to, to pay for you to do an article. Unless you want to do, if you want to do free things, yes. Blogs have opened up a lot of opportunities who want to contribute. There's an organization called American Horse Publications, a fabulous media organization of equine publics, you know, journalists, publishers. It's worth getting involved in. Uh, they've got a special deal going now. You can join for next year. It's open internationally too. And um, there are also a lot of corporate sponsors in there. 
but you know, there are chances for you to you know, do your own thing. My gosh, if you've got the skill and the ability to go good, good coverage and do it online, you know, the world's open to you. There was somebody who was talking about grants earlier. I've been trying to diversify myself in terms of reinvent myself as a lot of my colleagues start retiring and I'm going, okay, time to do the new version. There's an organization called SBDC. Small, it's a US organization partly funded by the Small Business Administration. But when you're talking about grants, um, they've got free services. And a, any business owner, if you're a freelancer, maybe you're, you're a sole proprietor. You know, if you're trying to do your media company or something, anything that you're trying to do, even if you're running your own equestrian business, um, you know, look into these resources. They've got free, they can give you advice on getting grants, some of the programs that are available, they have free advisors. And I think that as, you know, we need to really look beyond, whether you're on the media side of the horse business or any other part, or you want to participate in it. I mean, they've always been the way I wanted to go. They've always opened the door for me because that's, I, you know, I follow your heart. Mm -hmm. I ended up choosing my college because I saw horses and then we drove into the town. Mm -hmm. And I initially worked for United Airlines because I was talking about a horse club with the lady that was interviewing me and I didn't know I was being interviewed. Um, that was what I did right out of college. And eventually I just left everything and I reinvented myself as a freelance journalist. Mm -hmm. um, Leslie was talking about the book, The Doubt Horses. But, you know, when you can tell the stories and you keep turning the thing around, I mean, that's what got me connected me with Cavalia. Um, anyway, at some point, anyway, that's, I've got my list here. <laughs> there have been so many good things everybody's been bringing up. And I, I think that we've got a chance to, Melvin, you just lit a fire under a lot of things. Melvin's <laughs> always been out there at the forefront. He was going to China for things, you know, in terms of, you know, connecting people with horses. We've got a chance to connect the world with horses mm -hmm. and, um, and do a lot of good things in the process. Mm -hmm. But you got to be able to tell the story in different ways. And I mean, I even started doing Zoom rehearsals with my client and, um, kind of failed today. I was changing my background from the virtual one because the screen disappears, your hand does if you do something, but had a little tech issue. Don't update your <laughs> Mac to the next operating system two seconds before you go on the Zoom. Uh, but, okay, next person. Before we go though, I do have an email from the director of the new movie who wrote to me about why she, how she cast this individual in that role. So, yeah, Leslie, we have uh, several uh, members of, the, uh, of our panel who've raised their hand. Uh, mm -hmm. We may want to uh, go to some questions and then, yes. and then come back to the panel. Yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, Sarah oh, okay. and Emily, you had a question? Gotcha. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't realize my hand was still raised. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I had already had, I had, had already um, asked it in the youth panel. Sorry. All right. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, uh, Mia, did you have a question? Yeah. So I just wanted to say that you know, hearing Sally's story and hearing uh, you know Sarah and Emily's stories and all these stories about identity and representation and everything, I find a lot of comfort in that because I think sometimes you think you're alone when you know I have like beautiful natural big hair and I keep it in a braid 24 7 because everybody has an opinion about it everyone wants to you know be involved in that somehow and I think you know we're all used to code switching at least a little bit in our everyday lives I know for myself when I'm you know at home and it's my natural habitat or whatever I'm me I can be myself I can be comfortable I can listen to the music of my ancestors and you know be proud and you know and then when I go to a dressage show or something and people tell me you need to wear a lighter color foundation or you need to not listen to that music or whatever I think you know we all inherently do this sort of code switching both internally and externally we adapt the outside of our bodies sometimes to sort of hide who we are to be able to fit in, which I, you know, I hope someday we never have to do that. But I find a lot of comfort knowing that, you know, this isn't just me, although it's a horrible thing that it isn't just me. It's, it's a very familiar thing. And representation is so important. There's a quote by um, Jen Richards, who is a trans woman and an activist for representation of all kinds. And she says, um, there's a one word solution to media representation, more, 
then the occasional clumsy representation wouldn't matter as much because it wouldn't be all that there is. And I think that that's so true. I think that us just sitting here, having this forum, having this panel and acknowledging like we want to be seen, we want to be heard, um, we are who we are. I think that just existing in this world on a positive note is going to bring change. Our voices are going to be heard. Someday the world will catch up with us. And I think sometimes we feel like we're drowning, at least me. I'm just like, you know, drowning underwater, yelling at the top of my lungs, like, hear me, see me. What can I do to, to help my people? What can I do to help people of color? What can I do? And it's frustrating and it's, you know, time consuming and toxic and horrible. And it gives me solace to know that just being here, just being, you know, visible, just people seeing our melanin and our hair and like our voices and everything will bring awareness just existing <laughs> i think that that's that's a very positive thing to to be able to relax for one second and just exist and hope that that brings positive change because i think it will yes yeah and and, and then it's our job to you know as as media to find and shine the spotlight on those stories i know um you know there's just just listening um this summer one thing one initiative we did was we offered um a uh, five ended up being a $5,400 scholarship um, to minority uh, writers that they could they could use on the um, we ended up splitting it evenly between all 28 applicants because there's obviously no way to sort of hierarchy different voices um, but but it um, really opened to the floor um, to uh, to the voices that oftentimes are get overlooked and um, and aren't heard and just lifting up those voices. And so and, and it was incredible, you know, for a, a month straight every day on, on a venting nation, there was another, um, we had another, in Horse Nation, Jumper Nation, um, we had a different story being highlighted of a minority rider. Um, and um, and it, like, and I just, I learned so much, um, I think, uh, myself personally, um, our whole team did, and um, and hopefully our you know our readers too. Um, just being able to see on on the front page of the site every day, um, I thought I felt like that was important. Uh, did we have other did questions, uh, Emily? Yeah, Emily, and then Sandra had questions. Yeah, yeah thanks, Melvin. Um, so this is a, I hope this is okay to ask, but as a, as a white person, I recognize that there's just so much for me to learn about systemic racism because I've never experienced it. Um, and I'm so grateful to be here just listening to everyone's stories and learning. And like Caitlin mentioned earlier, um, what I think white people really need to be aware of is this white savior complex. And I was just, I kind of just wanted to get some perspectives on, you know, what do we need to be aware of as white people <laughs> to kind of, to avoid that white savior complex in the equine industry and just in, you know, yeah. in America I, in general. <laughs> I have an excellent answer to that question. I hope that this is helpful. You may have already done this. Have you heard of a book by Robin D'Angelo called White Fragility? I have, and it's on my list. I need to read it. <laughs> You know, I'm in a, you know, an interracial relationship. My partner is a white man. I'm a brown woman. So obviously it's like this huge dissonance between our levels of privilege. And I notice it every single day. And I think sort of he notices it too, notices things that he never noticed before. Um, so I <laughs> passive aggressively got him the book, White Fragility. And um, both of us have been reading it together. And even though it's about my people, my race, my culture, you know, people of color in general, I have learned so much from it on how to be like a better communicator, more empathetic to, you know, white people who genuinely don't know. Because I find myself sometimes, somebody will say something really racist or ignorant to me sometimes, and I'll just be like, not today, okay? <laughs> like, I don't have the patience for this. But then I have, I've learned to take a step back and realize that I need to be more empathetic. I need to be better at explaining my perspective from a less heated 
situation, I think I just get so bombarded sometimes it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And to put myself in your shoes, it's the same thing with you. I'm sure you get bombarded so often and you probably have so much guilt that it's, it's like this, this game between, you know, white people and people of color where everyone is kind of walking on eggshells and actually an excellent quote that I wrote down from Robin D'Angelo that I think is very fascinating. Um, so this is from White Fragil Fragility, why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism. Um, and this is, this doesn't necessarily apply to you because you're here. So mm -hmm. obviously you are doing all the right things. Um, mm -hmm. But it says, for white people and systems who have just recently recognized their own complicity in America's racist systems and are looking to, in quotation marks, fix that, it's not going to happen overnight. It's a little bit like saying, I want to be in shape tomorrow. This is going to be a process. The status quo in the United States is racism. It is comfortable for me, the author, D'Angelo, as a white person to live in a racist society. To sustain the momentum of these protests, it must become uncomfortable for white people to continue to benefit from racist systems. We've got to start making it uncomfortable and figuring out what supports we're going to put in place to help us continue to be uncomfortable because the forces of comfort are quite seductive. Racism is the foundation of the society we're in and to simply carry on without absolutely no active interruption is that system is to be complacent with it. And in that way, we can say that nice white people who really aren't doing anything other than being nice white people can be considered racist. We are complicit with that system. There is no neutral place. And to follow that up with, of course, a quote from Beyonce, because, duh, um, <laughs> she says, it's been said that racism is so American that when we protest racism, some assume we're protesting America. And, you know, although those quotes are sort of relative and relative to what you were saying, I think that, you know, you are doing a lot more than a lot of people are because there's a difference between like, you know, explicit racism and then just genuinely not knowing. I, you don't seem like the kind of person to me that would be slinging <laughs> racial slurs anywhere. And, <laughs> and you know, you, you're doing all the right things. I think the number one thing to do is just to listen to black and brown voices, to listen to voices of marginalized people and like get perspective on things like that and see that you know, we sort of both need to meet in the middle. I need to not be so, like, how could you say that word near me? And then, you know, people on your side, um, it's it's an amazing thing to just be able to listen. And you, I mean, I, I literally can't applaud you enough for being here, asking that question, which so many people are terrified to even bring up race, bring up class, bring up, you know, anything whatsoever. And the fact that you're asking that question means that, you know, you have it pretty much figured out. It's just race is such a nuanced and complex issue that if you're not, if you've never experienced racism in your life, there's no way that you could ever experience it, fortunately. But it's just something I think you have to work at your entire life, which sounds so daunting and so horrible, but I promise you it gets better with time. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Sandra, you had, you had a comment. I did, yeah. Um, obviously, we're talking about media and media, um, including social media. I mean, a lot of young people um, are members of uh, a lot of the forums that are on social media. And I particularly, um, the reason why I started the group that I started in July was from a comment that I put up on um, one of the uh, equine forums. And uh, it created such huge backlash of racism on there that you know, if I wasn't the person I was, I think I would have had a bit of melt, you know, a bit of a meltdown because it was just so terrible. Um, now, I mean, so I'm going to just give you a quick, very quickly, um, uh, one of the one of the comments I get, I got back last week. I put a post up last week because I won a, the, the National uh, Black British Business Awards, and I put a comment up on there. And basically, the guy said, "You're you are the one playing the race card. No one else." You are. You need counselling. Your racist attitudes are the blight, uh, a blight on our industry. This is a horse person. You think that you uh, because you are different colour to me that you are better. I'm. I'm for equality. You're clearly not. That's pure racism. This is a white guy. Yeah. Now we have. I have so many. If you go on to some of the the posts I've gone on, I have so many um, negative comments like that come across to me a lot of the BAME people that are on our site on our page so how do you how do you cope with that how do you deal with that sort of racism so blatantly obvious in your face 
I would never post anything up on these forums because I'm scared of getting all this backlash. And, and, and it's, it's true, this is something we are tackling through um, the member bodies and the affiliated memberships. We are tackling, we're trying to tackle accountability for people's actions on, um, on social media. But just going back to the other media side of it, the, the magazine media and that side of it, you know, we have on our group, we have uh, um, some of the main editors of, uh, news editors of some of the biggest um, magazines in the country. They're actually on our page. They, they see the, the BAME representation on our page and they're able to then report on a regular basis. We have a slot in the horse and hound every single, uh, every week and they, it is filled with BAME representation. So, you know, there's a couple of things there, media-wise, that, you know, maybe we could look at, um, you know, young people having to deal with um, the racist behaviour on, online and also using the media to have a regular slot so we're out there all the time. Yeah, I agree with that, definitely. I, I could chime in, too, just to piggyback off that, Sandra, in some way, too, is one thing that I thought of is, as media people, kind of going back to representation, um, you know, we talk a lot about telling stories of people and writing the stories, but the other thing that we as media can do is when you have a story that needs a source for writing exercise or for commentary on something, you know, don't just go to the same writers all the time. I mean, that's an easy way to inc increase representation in our media materials is to use um, more writers of color in not necessarily, it doesn't even have to be a feature story about them, but if you're writing a story, you know, uh, Tori, I know the Chronicle does a lot of instructional, educational type content. I mean, that's an opportunity for, for us too. I'm not trying to single you out, but, um, you know, to be able to bring in more sources of, of writers from different backgrounds. Um, so that just kind of occurred to me and because as I've been thinking about our responsibility as media and how we can create a community through our actions as well. Um, and also Tori, like you said, it hopefully eventually doesn't have to be just writing stories about somebody just because we want to draw attention to the fact that they're in a marginalized group because mm -hmm. hopefully the goal is that we have a whole pool of sources to draw from and, it, and eventually it's not as is uh is broken down to just the color of their skin which is unfortunately kind of what we focus on now um for for good reasons too uh so that's just something to be thinking about as members of the media i think to just learn how to further expand our reach to more communities mm -hmm. and hiring more people too <laughs> <laughs> Four writers of color on everybody's staff. I think that's another thing. And and, and I, that could also be a whole other panel is marketing uh, and brand responsibility as well. I mean, that's that's a huge part of it as well. The, the big, huge brands that have diversified their their marketing materials. That's, that's a huge step, in my opinion, also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so true. And, you know, what you were saying about marketing is I feel like sometimes I hear about programs and I don't hear about them until you know, there's like a press release that are like, oh, somebody got this grant for, you know, some kind of uh, marginalized person related grant. And then I never hear about the actual grant itself. And then later I hear that there's a press release about it. And, you know, I feel like some people really miss the mark on marketing and you have to just constantly be searching all the time for an opportunity when, you know, marketing is, is very important and would save everyone a lot of, <laughs> a lot of trouble. <laughs> And I think by that note, there's a lot of programs that we don't really know about as well because they're not really as well marketed. Like for instance, in para-dressage, it's sort of like the neglected step cousin of dressage. Everyone knows dressage, it's internationally popular. But for para-dressage, it's like this sort of niche that nobody really understands, nobody really knows about, nobody really is, you know, it hasn't really caught on nationally and internationally. And, um, you know, the marketing com campaigns behind it, they are doing everything for visibility, you know, with Hope Hand and Michelle and Maureen and, you know, all these people that are like these machines that get all the information out all the time. I feel like marketing and representation is the only thing that will save our butts because, <laughs> you know, they, they made this um, borrowed horse program in Tryon. This was um, last month and, um, I think that came about because there was like a demand for people who, you know, for instance, real talk, I'm on food stamps. I live meal to meal. This is just my life. Um, and so that the program, I think I spoke out, many other people spoke out about needing a borrowed horse program. And 
you know, marketing and people coming together and like networking came to make this beautiful creature that was a borrowed horse program. And I think, you know, we should keep that momentum and run with it and create more programs like that. And also, you know, the more we talk about it, the more we post about it, the more we think about it, the more we represent it. I think more good things will come from that. But, Mm -hmm. you know, marketing is like the the golden compass. Amazing. <laughs> in, in media, we're essentially the presenters of our sport, right? And I think, you know, if I think about my friends, they've, it's never dawned on them that they can ride horses. You know, it's never been packaged to them that this is a sport. Yes, it's expensive, but this is something for you. You know, if you're interested in it, there is a pathway for you. And I just think that, I remember, you know, I went to the Long Jeans Global Champions Tour at Miami Beach. And the cool thing about that show is it's right on the beach. So people who, you know, are just sunbathing, they can see the horses, you know, being groomed and they're standing ringside and everyone is so fascinated by horses. I think people have an innate, genuine draw to them, whether they know it or not. Um, And I think it's just presenting the sport in a way the average person can realize you know, whether it's through written articles or videography, photography, that the average person can, back to representation, see themselves in someone else and know that there's a place for them in the industry. Yeah. Tori, you were telling me earlier that you had looked into um, some sort of paths forward that other other sports, other big sports had taken to increase um, diversity, diversity and inclusion. Um, can you talk a little bit to that? Yeah, so as I, you know, started thinking more about what we can do um, in our industry to make it more accessible and inviting, I just looked to the mainstream model. So the big four, um, national, you know, the National Hockey League, the NBA, NFL, and I think Major League Baseball as well. And they have various, you know, diversity councils and immersion programs where they'll, I think it was the... um, Major League Baseball, they invited kids from, let's say, as they were, I think it was a South American country, and they just invited them for maybe like a camp where they, you know, taught them about the sports and allowed them to meet like the professionals. Just, and some of these programs um, or some of these industries, they have, you know, structured pipeline programs for people to be able to ascend to the top levels. And I mean, it's, it's a little bit different when you're talking about equestrian sport because it's so expensive. It's, you can't just pick up a basketball and go learn. Um, so I think it's, it is a bit different of a discussion as to how we can apply such a model, but I do think there are ways to, you know, learn from other sports and apply it to our own. But I do think that, you know, we do need involvement from the federations. And I think that's what we really need to step in and mm-hmm. to make, to do everything in their power to make it more accessible from the grassroots level up and to promote diversity and inclusivity and to engage in discussions when they arise and not just take a back seat and hope that no one acknowledges that they're not saying anything. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. To be honest. Like, uh, oh. oh, sorry, you go ahead. Oh, um, sorry, really quick. The only thing I was gonna say, Tori, that reminded me is I think one thing that we really need more of in our sports is um, top athlete participation. We don't see very much of that. And if you look to any other mainstream sport, uh, the NBA, when they were in their bubble, they put Black Lives Matter on the courts. They let the, the players do every, any sort of form of demonstration or protest. They allowed them to vacate entire games in protest. Um, the same for the NFL. They, they skipped some practices as a form of protest. And I think it's hard. Um, and, and I cannot speak for any top writer. And I know that there have been a lot of top writers who have wanted to help. So I am not trying to make a huge generalization here, but I think that a huge thing that's missing that's a little disappointing is the top athlete buy-in and participation. Um, haven't seen a lot of it. And yes, I know there's some that have, but that, it, that poses a challenge because what, you know, there's so many kids that are watching the Monday night football games and the basketball games and the baseball games, and they see this stuff and they know it's important where's that for us? So, you know, that's, that's also something I think that needs to be drawn attention. And it's not meant to shame anybody either. Everybody's entitled to do what's right for them. But I do think it's, it's significant that we don't see a lot of that. So Mm -hmm. just one thing I think is important. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also where the Federation comes in, because say for the NBA, the NFL, you know, these are 
these are implemented programs across the board. So say if the Miami Heat wins a game, it's like, okay, everyone on the team, you're all doing this. Whereas we have such an individual sport that I think the federations can really step in and say, you know, like the Long Jeans Masters, what I really appreciate about them is after every, like after a Grand Prix, I think it's like the top 10 or something they have to stay after and everyone signs autographs and, and interacts with the people, you know, who came to watch them. And I was, I'm doing this story for the Chronicle right now. And the subject she remembers going to the masters when she was younger and just the impact that that had on her being able to interact with them and ask them questions. Um, you know, that's something she remembers years later. And I think our sport needs to do a lot more of that. And it's now completely different in terms of how do we engage and connect with people in a pandemic state. But I think going forward, the federations really need to step up and be more visible and, you know, they they'll get the riders together with nation cups and have interviews but they're not giving the same level of F, um, energy and effort towards you know branching them out and letting them interact with fans and supporters which i think is really necessary mm -hmm. yeah that's that's a really good point that you make for dressage for instance you know i don't hear very much about I mean, you hear a lot of things about some of the top athletes that are unapproachable or, you know, not willing to get in on a cause, but I had an amazing experience with uh, Stefan and Shannon Peters. I think they're maybe some of the only very, very top level dressage people that like, you know, uh, they aren't up in a castle somewhere. They, they talk to people, they, they, um, you know, inspire people. They um, are approachable and sweet and nice and amazing people. When I was writing at Arroyo Del Mar, for this, um, like getting ready for the Wellington International Competition. Um, you know, I'm used to going to a barn and people are like, oh God, like what, <laughs> what is this? What's happening? And they ignore me, they're rude to me. They say, you know, they don't want me here, whatever the situation is. And then uh, like Stefan Peters was riding in the ring with me and I was like, oh crap, like <laughs> what is he gonna say? And then immediately he was like, yeah, that's so awesome that you're here and like, good for you. And you know, just such an amazing guy. and. You know, I feel like it's little moments like that, that, mm. you know, when you think about giving up, when you think about everyone being against you, when you think about all these top athletes that are sort of ignoring you and like too good and too, you know, whatever, don't want to talk to you, engage with you, exist in a world outside of their bubble. I think, you know, it takes people like Stefan Peters and Shannon Peters to, to be like, I can see that people kind of, you know, don't treat you that great. I want to be really nice to you and I'm going to make it so that this is a welcoming, kind, safe environment for people of all abilities, people of all races, people of all proclivities for any reason whatsoever. And that's, I would say Stefan and Shannon Peters are like the top people I've ever heard of in dressage doing that. And mm -hmm. I feel like it shouldn't be a one-off thing. Like, I feel like there shouldn't be one name for people to do that because it's, it's a life-changing situation. But Maybe there's more, you know, I'm sure there's more. I just don't know about them. And I will say that just, I mean, earlier this summer, I joined forces with some of the top writers in show jumping. And then um, I can just name them. Adrian Stern, like Lucy Delorier, Paige Bellissimo and I, we started the Equestrian Cooperative, which is we're trying to kind of foster, you know, conversation and diversity um, in our industry. And one thing we've realized in having conversations with the top you know, riders and industry officials is, you know, there are people who are just as passionate about wanting to bridge that gap, but they have their own anxieties, you know, they don't want to say the wrong thing. They, I was speaking to a rider who called me and we were just having a conversation and he said, you know, I don't, I, you know, I, I jump horses over poles for a living. I don't have all the answers. So I think there are people who genuinely want to do more and to, figure out ways to help, but they also have their fears of what if I say the wrong thing or, you know, what do I actually know? So I think panels like this um, are good opportunities for people to just kind of sit with each other and reason and, and understand that we're all figuring this out together, you know, as long as there's respect, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. And it's just extending, you know, a hand and saying, you know, I'm willing to listen and learn and try to do what I can to mm -hmm. contribute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And, uh, you know, on the note, I think somebody mentioned something about, what was it in the chat? Um, what was it? 
Oh yeah, about um, you know, the sports having people that that you know people of color that are highly represented at the highest levels and relatable and all these things. And I've noticed that for dressage and paradressage, I don't think there's been a single person of color that's gone to the Olympics, Paralympics, etc. Um, this might be different for other disciplines, maybe jumping or Western or something. This might be different. But um, when I found that out, I was kind of shocked, but not really surprised. But my hope for the future is that it'll be like a Serena Williams, like Simone Biles situation where you know, they're the most famous names in ten tennis, they're the most famous name in gymnastics, they're people of color, because they had to hustle twice as hard, work twice as hard as everybody else to get half as far, so they're the best at their game, and I'm hoping that, you know, nobody really knows about <laughs> equestrian sports as a whole, it's a very unattainable concept to have, so, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we'll get one strong black woman winning the Olympics, the Paralympics, whatever, and then they'll be the, the Serena Williams, they'll be the the Simone Biles and then our sport will be popular and we'll get more sponsors and you know we'll actually be popular at the Olympics and people will tune in to watch and <laughs> mm -hmm. you know it says a lot that they're the you know the most famous people in the sport are women of color I think mm -hmm. that maybe this model will adapt to our sport someday mm -hmm. yeah all right uh, thank you very very much Leslie that was a very outstanding panel uh, wow, a lot of, lot of, lot of knowledge there. Uh, we're going to move on. Uh, we're running a little bit behind, but no one cares. Uh, we're going to move on now to our final panel, uh, the international panel. Um, we're going to ask everyone, if you don't mind, to just hang around a little bit after the international panel. Uh, we have a number of questions coming in from the audience. I want to make sure that we have a chance to address uh, those in the audience. Um, uh, we're going to run a little bit late, but we'll, we'll try to get ourselves wrapped and, and out of here at a reasonable hour. All right, uh, Leslie, thank you very much for uh, directing this discussion. It was a, a, a huge and very informative uh, opportunity. I'm going to turn the floor over now to our friend from the UK, uh, Julian Seaman, uh, who has uh, graciously agreed to be the discussion leader for our final panel today uh, on the international uh, equestrian scene. Julian? Julian, you need to unmute. Yep. Okay. I'll be there. Good. You're there. You're there. I can hear you. Can you see me? Yes, we can see and hear you now. Excellent. Excellent. I've been <laughs> I've been I've been watching all night. Um, I, I hope your your um, viewers are watching this because. Um, to be honest, I was with you last year in America, where we had a fairly modest little gang. This actually is the way to go for you. Mm -hmm. it, I agree. Honestly, it really is the way to go. It, it, it's happened because COVID and all that. But the, the amount of people you've managed to get on board to talk their stuff Honestly, this is this is definitely the way to go, <laughs> you know. Um, so um, it's a shame because I won't be able to come to America next year. But, uh, but, <laughs> don't count on that, my friend. Don't count on that. You know, you know that you're always welcome at Harambe Park. <laughs> You'll but, always but, be welcome. Oh, that that's great. It was damn good fun last year. But but just listening all evening, um, it, it's it's been so. Positive, so positive, and and what, as I said to you, when we were doing our test the other day to, to make sure that we could make this work, it is that within a year, the whole thing has completely moved on an enormous, enormous bounce, hasn't it? Yes. Um, I mean, seriously. I mean, you know, with with horse and hound giving pages to it in this country, your country. All of that. The, the, the one thing I, I would say, if, if people are still tuned into this, um, I think we need to be on the positive, not on the negative. Oh, nobody wants us. Yes, everybody wants you. Everybody wants you. That there, there genuinely has, has never been, and I heard one or two of your contributors today saying, oh, you know, people don't want people of colour in the sport. Certainly in our country, it makes absolutely no difference at all. I mean, no difference. You know, if you if you want to do it, come and do it. 
will will take you in and introduce you to everyone. Yeah, and well, well, um, Julian, Julian, you have to understand uh, that you are the exception. Uh, if I can speak from a personal standpoint, whenever I've been in your press room, yes, indeed, I have felt 100% welcome, 100% respected. The difference is that in many other press rooms, I have not had that same experience. Well, that that's that is a shame, and um, and I'm no longer a press officer, so. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 the whole thing might slide back. I do hope not. It won't. It won't. Um, but but um, you know, in this country, as you've seen, because I've emailed you uh, or sent over. Um, lots of stuff from horse and hand and things they're really bigging it up they're, they're certainly bigging it up with sandra and things like that and, and lydia who i introduced you to just yesterday i think and as i say i thought you knew about lydia hayward but lydia's the probably the highest level of girl of color at the moment in eventing and and she's living in gloucestershire and doing really well and for some i'm not quite sure how we ended up by being instagram friends but we've been sort of mates for about six six months, um, and and she's doing really well. And in this country, frankly, yes, it's 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 difficult. Um, no, it's not difficult. Just people of colour don't necessarily get into doing it, but they're very welcome if they want to. I mean, absolutely, yeah. nobody's stopping them. Nobody. Nobody's stopping them at all. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, I, I totally disagree with you. You want to be, in, you want to be in my shoes, yeah, Julian. I'm sorry. I know we're both in the same country here, but you want to be in my shoes for the last forty years, yeah. And you yeah. tell me whether I'm not welcome when I stand yeah. on the side of the line when my daughter's going round a ring, and I can hear people saying, "Look at that nigger going round there," yeah. No, no, Julian. It's not like that. I'm sorry. Yeah, you may you may sit there and say that, but I'm sorry, be in my shoes, and then you come and tell me whether that's how you feel. I'm I'm genuinely horrified to hear that people say that. Um, it was <laughs> hopefully hopefully me that put you in touch with Melvin to, you know, because I I've read about no, it you. Wasn't, and I, no, it wasn't okay. Post, my post, yeah. Okay, but but um, I saw I saw your thing in Horse and Hound. And I thought this is a great story because I went out to Carolina last year with Melvin um, to promote this. And I will listen to anything you've got to say, anything, well, anything you've got to call. say. You give me a call and I will, I will chat to you. Um, yeah. Because honestly, I have been in the industry for 50 years. Yeah. And in that time, I have been British dressage, British show jumping, British eventing myself. And my daughter's been through Pony Club, British Show Jumping, British Eventing, and British Dressage as well. So we've been through the lot. And my daughter was one of the best riders in this county. And she dropped off saying, Mum, why, why, what, can, what do I have to do to show people that I'm good? Yeah, that's a 15-year-old girl, yeah, who was talented, hugely talented. Yeah, you don't see it because you don't have to see it. Yeah, but we exactly. see it because we can't avoid seeing it. Yeah. And the thing is, until you are wearing our boots, until you are seeing it from our point of view, you cannot say what you've just said. Because I will well, disagree I agree. with you every I time. No, I, I, I'm, I, I, I entirely understand that because obviously I can't see it from your perspective for obvious reasons. You know, um, mm -hmm. I'm a privileged white guy who's. Have have my chances, so I I completely get that. I completely get that. But what I would like to think is that through Melvin and the whole setup, and which is why I've come on board with it for from last year, but before anyway, is that we're trying to change it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 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 definitely. I mean, you know, have you heard of Burke? Have you heard of Burke? which is the BAME Equine and Rural Activity Focus Group on Facebook. No. Okay, well. Was it through to me? Yeah. Okay, if you haven't, um, you know, I will, I'll, I will obviously contact you about it, but. You've frozen. 
Uh, Julian, let's 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 uh, table this for just a second sure. until Sandra can get back online. And I know that uh, Marvin and Michael and uh, Jean Philippe are, are are waiting to speak as well. Sandra, are you back? Yeah, I think I. Okay, I we we lost gone. you for just a second there. Yeah, I didn't realize I'd gone. Sorry. Um, I'm a part of the uh, British Equestrian Federation Equality Engagement Group, which tackle are hoping to tackle. Um, equality and diversity in, in uh, the British Equestrian Federation and um, we have a part, as part of birth what we do is we go on to that group and we advise there for what they can they how they can improve the equality and diversity within the whole of the equine industry uh, sorry the sports side of it sorry and so you know because I'm on that group as well and we've got birth we have a wealth of um, um, resources we have people on there that have the same experiences as I've had that their children have had horrendous experiences and they're still having horrendous experiences now you know we're, we're, and, uh, but we have this group now that people can come to and it's a safe haven it's a safe place for them to come and share their experiences now the thing is what Julian's just said about you know all everybody's welcome um, it's it's just not like that it really isn't like that you know, some people may not experience as, as much racism as other people, but it's there, it's underlying in every... Let me give you an example. I've just, okay. come, through, I've just come through cancer treatment, okay? And I've lost my hair, okay? But my hair is Afro hair, it's not white hair. So when my head gets wet and sweaty, it doesn't go flat like white hair goes flat. My hair goes curlier. So my hat gets tighter. So at the moment, because I have not got my braids in, I have got my hat at the moment doesn't fit me. So I went on to Facebook and I asked a question. I reached out to people. I'm a black equestrian. I'm a black eventer. Can somebody let me know another black person or, you know, um, and is there any other black eventers out there? Now, I didn't need to justify why I asked that question, but I asked if there, I was reaching out to other black eventers. Now, the backlash I got from that was dis absolutely disgusting. They were calling me a racist because I only wanted to get in touch with black people. Now, I'm sorry, but I didn't want, I don't need to get in touch with white people because white people don't have the same hair as me. So why would I then reach out to white people for that, that question? I don't, so I actually literally go and justify why I was asking the question because I was getting so much racism from people saying well I've got curly hair I you know why don't you ask me well your hair's not like my hair love and you can't do you, you you can't give me advice on on my hair because you don't have the same hair as me but the amount of racism I got from that 800 comments it generated 800 but to be honest what has that got to do with horses sorry what has that got to do with horses what a riding hat asking the, the no 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 you, you you've you've done you you've spoken very eloquently yeah a, 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 about your your problems with hair and things like that but but you you shifted away from racism in in horses okay That's, right. that had nothing to do with that giving, right. so the people that were giving me the racism were actually affiliated members of British dressage, British eventing. They're affiliated members that come under the, the, the codes of conduct of these affiliated associations. So they should not be saying these racist things to me on Facebook because they come under these affiliated associations. So you're saying that there's, oh, you don't see it. You don't see it in, in the industry, but I'm sorry, it's there, but you don't see it on the level that they are, they are at. Yeah, you don't see that. So. What I'm trying to say is it, my hair may have not have anything to do with it, but it's the, the racism that comes from the people that, are, that I'm talking to. Can you see what I'm saying? I can, but it's got nothing to do with horses. Of course it is. It's, it is the people that are actually saying it that are affiliated to British show jumping, British dressage. And, so if these are the people that we are dealing with, they, these are the people that have got these opinions. They've got the unconscious bias opinions or they've got these opinions that are, are racist. And that's what I'm saying. It has got to do with horses because the, these are the people that ride them. 
Okay. But, ha, okay. Do you agree with me, with Mia? This is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think, you know, we had a discussion earlier where, I don't know if you're on the chat yet, um, you know, one of our allies, who's a white person, asked, what can I do? Because I can never be in your shoes and therefore I can never understand. That is the best question to ever ask somebody. And then the key thing to after you ask a person of color a question like that is listening, understanding, empathy, and generally speaking, just, you know, we tend to know what we're talking about. And yeah. a lot of people have enough privilege to think that racism maybe doesn't exist in certain places or at certain times or around certain people, but racism exists anywhere where humans exist it's just a matter of if you have enough privilege to witness it or not when people are saying these things to her like i don't know if you know the diaspora of ethnic hair natural hair all of these things it is ingrained in microaggressions of white people and black and brown culture microaggressions are in itself racism it comes down to racism because that's exactly what it is when people are talking about a person of color's hair or wanting to touch a person of color's hair or asking insane things about the person of color's hair it by default that's a microaggressive act of racism and julian i think that maybe you aren't necessarily being naive but to think that racism doesn't happen where you are um, maybe it would be a good idea to listen to Sandra when she tells you, you know, you guys are from the same across the pond and, you know, you guys are two vastly different people. You maybe have a little more privilege than her and it's a good thing to acknowledge that and understand that what Sandra's saying is completely valid. I've experienced racist stuff all the time when I've had people tell me racism doesn't exist in Santa Barbara, racism doesn't exist in California, mm -hmm. racism doesn't exist here, there, wherever. You know, we elected a liberal president. We, you know, elected a liberal governor. We have the most liberal politics in California. And I rarely, you know, go to work or go to the barn or go, you know, to the grocery store. Something, something has to happen that's racist or sexist or mm -hmm. ableist or, mm -hmm. you know, these, you know, Michelle Obama said every single day women and women of color were getting cut a little bit and we're bleeding constantly. And yet we still get up, we fight we walk because this is what we deal with on a daily basis is, you know, it kind of adds insult to injury when, you know, Sandra is actively, you know, people are being so unbelievably racist to her, which it's sad that it doesn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Julian, I think maybe what I would like to think that you were saying is that you personally aren't racist, but I don't think that you can speak as, you know, England or, you know, whatever city you're from in general isn't racist because historically speaking, you know, privileged sports like dressage or riding or jumping or eventing or whatever generally goes hand in hand with microaggressions, racism, et cetera. I go to clinics all the time where racist things happen to me, to my friends, to up to the very, very few people that are people of color in the sport. And I would like to say, Sandra, you, you and Julian have like enacted a scene that I think is a very beautiful learning experience because, you know, Julian, you didn't do anything wrong. I want you to know that, you know, we're not like mad at you or we don't <laughs> hate you or whatever. We just, we sort of go through this thing oh, every God. day, all the yeah. time, constantly, nonstop. And it hurts really bad to hear, well, it doesn't mm. happen here. It doesn't happen there. It doesn't happen around me because it happens 24 and seven. Like I'll be driving home in my neighborhood and my neighbors will say something racist. And I'm like, I cannot escape this. <laughs> Like it's just an inescapable feeling. Right. It's a if, feeling. I, if, I, if I might interject just for a second, uh, I want to uh, move on. I, I recognize the validity of the discussion that we're having, but I'd like to move on if possible. Uh, I'd like to first of all welcome a very distinguished member uh, of our panel uh, to the discussion, and that is Donna Marie Cheek who was the first African-American to represent the United States in an equestrian event. Donna, it's wonderful to see you. We welcome you. And we, we really would like to get your perspectives. I also want to re-recognize uh, Marvin Bragman, uh, who's a uh, distinguished competitor uh, from Bermuda, who competed in the most recent uh, World Equestrian Games. And also get back uh, to Jean-Philippe, our representative from the FEI, and uh, to uh, Michael Stone uh, as well. So. If 
<laughs> if we can move the discussion to that, and then we can come back a little bit later and 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 and, and, and finalize this other discussion. But I'd, I'd like to start off welcoming Donna, and then we'll go to Marvin, uh, Jean Philippe, and to Michael. Welcome, Donna. Thank you, Mel. How are you? I'm well. Good. Good. Am I late? You're okay. You're, you're, you're never late. You're always right on time. You know that. <laughs> okay. So, so I was listening to some of the comments about um, the racism that is encountered on a regular and daily basis. But one of the things that I would like for us to do is to utilize this time to talk about some answers and talk about some constructive ideas and steps so that we can move the sport towards inclusivity. One of the things I would like to mention is um, there are, are two existing organizations or programs that I think we need to look at and potentially other people have other ideas as um, uh, using them as a tool to not only support them directly, but also not reinventing the wheel and, and uh, supporting these programs and potentially duplicating them um, at other states. In California, we've got the, um, we have the, the Compton Junior Equestrians, which was formerly the Compton Junior Posse. And that organization is, is extremely inclusive and vital for the people of color in the inner city to stay off the streets and stay on a horse. And Grand Prix rider Will Simpson is one of the board members. And that's in the inner city. And that's a very vital and sustainable organization that needs help. The other one is the Work to Ride program in Philadelphia. That's a program that has a, not only does it use inner city uh, people of color for their program and to teach them responsibility, but they also have a championship polo team and they have a professional polo player that came from the Work to Ride program, and his name is Kareem Rosser. And it also appears, based on their website, that there's some sort of partnership with Ralph Lauren, because Ralph Lauren is using these uh, polo, young polo players, these members of Work to Ride, in their marketing campaigns. So these are just two very specific organizations that as we talk about it, they're on the ground actually doing it. And I don't know if anybody else knows of others, but these are the two that um, uh, I did my research on because I had heard them in mainstream media. And, and I think that's where the discussion should begin. And to kind of piggyback off of what you're saying, Donna, there's what I've realized or what I've come to know within the past few months is there's so many of those programs at the grassroots level. So Thank many. Thank you. It's just a matter of them being represented and getting the recognition that they deserve. But I think, you know, that's another opportunity for, say, a federation to kind of put people in contact with these organizations. And that's something my friends and I are trying to do with the Equestrian Cooperative is to kind of champion these organizations that are already in place and that are doing the work yes. that necessary and just giving them the exposure um, that they need. But, you know, I think it would, be, it would surprise so many people to know how diverse the sport is at those levels and how, um, how they're kind of bridging the gap of accessibility for the community around them. Yes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm so heartwarmed to hear that because I would like for us to focus on solutions. We as people of color, we know all the problems. We can exhaust that for the next four hours. Whereas I think our time is better spent to focus on these particular org organizations or like yours, Tori, which, which can be the umbrella where if the FBI or any other governing body wants to 
put their money where their mouth is or want to be a liaison between corporate and these grassroots organizations, then they can represent these organizations on an international level or at a national level and do fundraising or corporate sponsorship and then the money getting funneled to these grassroots organizations. Uh, Donna, uh, if I could ask one question. Uh, is there a place where people uh, in the audience can learn about these organizations? Uh, can we post something to a website uh, that would give contact information for these various uh, grassroots organizations? Well, yes, because the, um, the Compton Junior Equestrians.org, that's their website. And of course, they're also on Facebook. Facebook. And then Work to Ride. Uh, dot com, the Work to Ride program in Philadelphia. And those are just the two that I have seen um, nationally represented and appear to be doing really, really well, especially the Work to Ride program, because they're expanding with a large indoor arena and, and their partnership with Ralph Lauren. I think that should be our prototype that we should try to not reinvent the, wind, we, the wheel, but to duplicate what's already being, being done and what's already very successful. Very good. Can I just mention, can I, sorry, can I just jump in here? Yes, you can. Um, it, the FAI itself also has grassroots development programs going all the time, especially to um, our nations in Africa, the, the real developing nations. I mean, we're not the size of the USA. Um, there's huge, there's really good funding available for grassroots levels. And I think JP will probably embellish a bit more on that. Absolutely. Uh, let's go to Marvin and then to JP. Uh, Sandra, we'll get to your question in just a moment. Uh, Marvin, uh, what are your thoughts in terms of, let's say, a more international focus? Um, good evening, panel. How's everybody? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting conversations tonight. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd just like to, to uh, just kind of address the, the positive part of being a, uh, a black equestrian. Now, I guess I feel pretty blessed. I'm so sorry that people in different parts of the world have to go through such a hard time. In Bermuda, we just, it just, there's, there's racism everywhere, but in Bermuda, uh, black kids, even when I was a kid, I, I'm 50, I'll be 53 next month. And I start riding when I was nine and in the seventies, we were welcomed uh, to ride. And in fact, at the riding school that I grew up at, there was a, quite a few uh, black kids and some of us went off to have great career in, in equestrian and, and, and some of them quit. But the thing is, uh, in Bermuda, even now, I've got a little cousin that's competing now. M my cousin just texted me uh, some results of her competition today. In, in Bermuda, it's just, uh, it's just accepted. It's, we're equal, uh, we're people. You know, it's not so much as if you're black and if you're white. And now I live in Georgia. Now I've been in America for 20 years. I live in the South. And I have experienced racism, but my focus isn't on what other people uh, like or don't like. My focus is on what and always has been. My papa told us when we were growing up, uh, when people say things about us, is their mouths, they can say what they like. We don't wait for people to treat us well or to accept what we want to do or, or try to allow people's uh, opinions or, 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 or negative uh, negativity to, to kind of interfere with what we've got going on. At least I haven't been taught to do that. And even, like I said, I live in the South and I've encountered lots of racism, but I move forward. I, don't, I look at that, if I, if, I, if I encounter racism, I look at that as their problem, not mine. And so I don't take on other people's stuff. I've got a full plate. I'm, I want to ride. I ride horses all day, every day, and, and I'm competing and, uh, and moving forward. So I just wanted to say something positive about you know, my, my uh, experiences, even, even here in the South. I go around a lot of different farms, around mostly white people. And I pretty much am accepted. 
you know, and, I, and everything's been great. And so as far as what you said about the international thing, uh, right now I ride endurance for those of you that, uh, uh, that just came in or some people didn't hear me say earlier, I'm an endurance rider. Uh, I just started riding endurance six years ago. I am a dressage and show jumper. Uh, I have a, a background in, in that uh, discipline, but I kind of ventured off into endurance. And uh, because of COVID, everything's been pretty much shut down, but uh, things are kicking back in now. And looking forward to even here in America, having the, the national uh, competition in, in May in Montana. So we're preparing for that. And on an international level, the, um, the World Endurance Championships, I think is in Italy next summer. Uh, so uh, hopefully, I don't know if I can get to that because there's a whole lot going on still, you know, with COVID and stuff like that. So I don't know about that kind of stuff, but I'm gonna continue to compete for the nationals here in America. And I have aspirations to continue on to go to the next World Equestrian Games in two years. So uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, my riding is concerned and like the topic tonight has been a, a lot about race, you know, even when we were looking at talking with the youth, I just would encourage everybody to do you, do what you do. I mean, Miss Donna, you've accomplished a lot, you know, I'm pretty sure you uh, encountered racism, but we don't let stuff stop us. Ms. Mia, who cares what people have to say in your neighborhood when you're driving by? Do you? Do you? Go along and do you. That's what I would say to people. And Sandra, same thing. You talked about how you and your daughter, your daughter's uh, 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 very talented and stuff like that. Press on. Press on. Do you? I know it's tough. I know it can be really yeah. tough. She's Sorry, she's dropped out. She's a singer now. She's oh, good. Out. I'm still. Doing oh, she's it. out. She's out of horses. Yeah. Well, okay, but press, just press on. We just press on. We do. We study our craft. We improve our skills. We get better at what we do, and, and we just do the best that we can do. We just, you know, we just strive on. That's kind of like my motto. I just press through. And whenever I encounter any negativity in my life, I say that's not going to help my cause. So it's out. Whatever's not going to help my cause, whatever, whatever's not going to add to me, <laughs> you got to go. And so <laughs> I just move forward. That's kind of how I live my life. And, and, I, and, I, and I welcome in positivity and I like to filter out negativity. And we all, I mean, that's just something that we all have to do, even if it's not race related. You know, we all have to deal with a lot of negativity in life. But we just power through because that's what we do. <laughs> and look, horse people are the strongest people in the world. You know what kind of beasts we have to work with every day? We are strong. <laughs> That's my man. Wow, wow. Always, always positive. Thank you so much, Marvin. You're welcome. Uh, JP, uh, the Thanks FBI's so perspective is obviously very, very important. Uh, in this discussion. Uh, can you give us an overview of some of the things that are going on in your office uh, and also some of the programs that you oversee uh, on behalf of the FEI worldwide? First of all, I, I'm sorry, I'm the only one in this topic, in this panelist group. I'm French and it's not, uh, English is not my native language. And uh, excuse me if by moment my words are not exactly... Not, not a problem, not a problem. Well, Thank you, Melvin, to invite uh, FEI in, in this uh, debate, in this discussion. I understand uh, lots of um, lots of different words and lots of also uh, lots of people suffered a lot. Um, I have a chance. I'm a world citizen. I've been working uh, for more than 35 years now to transform uh, ideas, vision into action on the ground. I have this chance now uh, to be in charge of the development of the International Equestrian Federation. And for my job, I, I've been working in, in more than 98 different countries around the world. Never United States, I'm sorry, because you are not a developing country. But Gigi, you know me, I work with you from now more than 10 years. Um, I saw you invite uh, my friend from Julian Hyde from uh, Jamaica with uh, the first and best uh, level three coach, Black, from Jamaica. 
Also, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're right. To increase diversity, the main and the first uh, tool is the modification of the basic sports structure in a country. Yes, we have in Europe, probably, in certain country, like my country, sorry, I'm French, um, it's possible to ride one hour for the same price of a McDonald's meals. In this situation, it's possible to increase diversity. It's possible to speak, a cash transport is open now. Yes, in certain European country now, it's possible for a very basic cost to taste, to have this first contact with this fantastic horse, fantastic animals or pony. Yes, the national sports structure is probably the most important tool. When you speak, Donna, about uh, Donna Maricek, you speak about the uh, necessary uh, uh, involvement, the necessary um, action. You speak about uh, diversity, we speak about uh, equity, we speak about social inclusion. Yes, uh, the horse will never judge you on the basis of your origin, the color of your skin, your age, your physical capacity, your social position. The horse is diversity, the horse is generosity. That's why we have a fantastic tool to approach, to help the people. In many countries, FEI help social inclusion. We develop school program to offer the opportunity for lots of children, whatever the color of the skin, because it's during the school time to go on the riding school, on a pony club, and to try to ride. Because this is the first step. The possibility to have the chance to open the door of one riding school, one pony club. And Sandra, I understand uh, what you said. Because I was in certain countries uh, in, in a complicated situation. We offered also lots of courses for coach. Why? Because without good coach, no development, no chance to uh, open the door of equestrian sport, of equestrian activity for many people. Uh, you speak about uh, social inclusion. Yes, uh, increase, to increase diversity, it's necessary absolutely to permanently um, support the different uh, solution and proposition. But I don't think the system of um, charity is a good system. I think it's a worse system, charity. Why? Because charity is a recognition of difference between different people. And for us, again, I'm sorry, I'm French, uh, charity is not the best. The best is the inclusion, the in including equestrian sport in sport program. For example, in certain country, it's mandatory to, to know uh, swimming when you have 11 years. And fortunately, it's not mandatory to ride. <laughs> but it would be a dream for me <laughs> if it was a, in a school program. But it's not a joke. Uh, many, many uh, riders start one day by uh, school initiation, by the school initiative. It's one of the best solution. Um, GD, uh, in, in Southern Africa, we develop a lot of school program to offer this solution. But we also propose uh, lots of um, um, gender equality uh, program or uh, lots of uh, program to transform in, uh, in real vision, the region in real action. As for example, GD, the social integration program we have in South Africa, we have a social integration program in many countries now, in Asia, in uh, South America, and uh, all these countries develop now an important uh, sports structure open for all. After, I'm agree with Michael Stone, we don't need to be here. Equestrian sport is one of the most expensive sport in the world because our sport system is based on the owner of the top horses choice the best rider and is not like uh, systematically 
the best uh, young. It's extremely hard now for a young rider to have the chance to receive a good horse because a good rider stayed 20, 25, 30, 35 years. For this reason, the movement is very slow. And uh, when you have 20, 25, black, white, yellow, whatever, it's always very hard, very difficult to find an owner and find a good horse because you're 20, 25. All these realities, ladies and gentlemen, are our realities, your realities, and yes, uh, sorry, I'm a little bit, uh, by a moment, confused, but um, FEI works now a lot on the ground for developing country, definitively. It's my job every day. My department is named FEI Solidarity Department. And uh, I work regularly every day on the ground to educate, to teach, to promote values. And uh, I hope these values guide us uh, in our activities in equestrian sport. I think, GD, perhaps you can help me a little bit because you speak English much better. What, what, what could you... Gigi, yes, sorry, I'm trying to unmute my, I was trying to unmute my button here, it took a, it took a while. Um, yeah, we, we the, the FEI office under the solidarity umbrella, the projects, for instance, um, Sport for All, um, they have the ferrier courses, they have the um, groom courses, because we're talking, when you talk horses, you talk an industry, and there's a lot that plays and becomes part of that whole big family. Um, and there are all these programs available. And I think what the FEI is also doing, they're constantly looking for more to develop and different ideas to develop and grow the sport from the grassroots level up. Um, Africa, if I look at Africa, the, the drawbacks of Africa is culture and the cost. And it's like JP said, cost is a real factor. Not everyone can afford that but there are ways around. Um, the fact is the horse doesn't discriminate. It's there for all of us to enjoy and um, encourage the sport. I had a... Also, sorry, oh, we sorry. have also, I, I just also, I forget one important point. Uh, to compete on certain level, and Marvin, you explained very well, to compete on certain level, the the, the horse, the sport horses, uh, are um, extremely costly, right? But the the quality of the rider and the, the competence of the rider, the skill of the rider, uh, is possible to develop on the history, on the education program, and yes, um, arriving on a certain level. <laughs> Uh, it's not a question of, of gender, it's not a question of, uh, of the nationality, it's not a question of skin. It is a question of um, situation probably, because it's probably easier in certain countries. I totally agree. But uh, Marvin, you come from Bermuda. I was in Bermuda. Uh, I discovered a very nice but small country. But you know, uh, I was also... Um, in different countries, of course, different than Bermuda, like Yemen or a very, very poor country. And I observe plenty of very talented riders. Uh, and for example, we have a fantastic uh, championship or fantastic um, uh, event with a youth, yog, youth Olympic Games. Uh, in the Youth Olympic Games, it's the only one Olympic sport where the riders compete with borrowed horses. And I remember when the Senegalese uh, girl was uh, competing in the Youth Olympic Games and the president of the Olympic Committee asked to this girl, you come from Senegal? And she said, yes, sir, I come from Senegal. And you compete in Senegal? Yes, sir, I compete in Senegal. And you, who is your coach? Uh, this is a this big, big black guy. Oh, is your coach? Yes, he's from Senegal. 
And uh, it's incredible because uh, from Senegal, you're so good writer. I said, why not, sir? You know, <laughs> I, I was in this US Olympic Games and uh, it was fantastic to observe how the young generation uh, with Burhard Ossis, without the, the system, the selection of money, because we've, on Burhard Ossis, more or less, you have the same chance, okay? Uh, you, you, your, uh, your bank account is not, don't make the difference. And it, it's interesting to observe this. I have a chance in my job to regularly observe this. And yes, uh, FEI try to increase diversity, to increase uh, gender equality, to uh, develop a uh, sport around the world for, for human. Uh, JP, if I can just jump in for a second. Uh, you mentioned the Youth Olympic Games. Uh, am I correct in my understanding that the next edition of the Youth Olympic Games are actually going to be held on the African continent? Yes, the, the, the last, the last uh, Youth Olympic Games um, was in um, Argentina in 2018. And the next one uh, will be in Senegal. Unfortunately, due to the recent difficulties, uh, COVID plus uh, economical difficulties, uh, Senegal uh, postponed for 2026. Oh, but okay. but uh, FEI, our president in my divorce, proposed to organize on the same date in 2022 um, World Equestrian Festival for Youth, based on the same rules, on the same system of qualification, to maintain the Olympic spirit in our sport. And based on the same rules, uh, we have um, started a bid to um, ask from one country to organize in 2022 uh, youth um, or young uh, equestrian festival mm -hmm. to, to replace the Youth Olympic Games in equestrian sport. And many international federations propose the same for the sport. Yeah, that's, that's fabulous because I know a number of us were looking forward to uh, 2022 because that would be the first, as I understand it, the first time that any Olympic event, senior or youth, had ever been held on the African continent. And we thought that that was going to be quite significant. So uh, we'd like to get more information about that when, when, when it's available. Also, um, fact, what, uh, yeah. what discipline fact, is this? It's always in show jumping is for the discipline is show jumping because it's on broad horses and it's complicated to organize the uh, eventing in broad horses and oh, it's a in broad horses. But we have also every year the final of the FIA World Equestrian Challenge with broad horses also, where it's possible for all the riders around the world from all the developing country to participate on a world final on the same, same equality chains, same chains does, of equality. Does the U.S. qualify for this program or is there like a pre-qualifying process? Like how do I get there per se? Like even though I just do for, dressage, for the, is there an option for- the for... U.S. Olympic Games, the qualification- Oh, I'm too old for that, but- <laughs> yeah, It's from, I mean, from like... 40, 40 to 80. But uh, for, for the young the U.S. Olympic Games, the qualification come from the different uh, international uh, or continental championship for US is uh, American Young Show Jumping Championship. But uh, for oh, many countries around the world, it's a final of the equestrian challenge, a world challenge. Is there like a similar program like this for just dressage for old folks like me that aren't, you know, young whippersnappers? No, no. US Olympic Games is managed by IOC, International Olympic Committee. And as FEI, we are just in charge to organize the sport. But the, the rules of IOC regarding Youth Olympic Games uh, are um, mandatory. Uh, we, we, we can change uh, like this. And that's why for the moment, Youth Olympic Games are on the road horses and show jumping only. Yeah, that borrowed horse thing is so cool. It's like an innovation. I don't know why there's not more programs like that. Like the U.S. here had just adopted the borrowed horse program in October. And, you know, I'm surprised it's not everywhere all the time because it's so prohibitively expensive to have your own horse and ship your own horse and, and do all of that. So, you know, good for you guys. And I'm glad that we have it now for para, at least since October. 
Well, show jumping is my thing. I would definitely love to be involved. Mel, you're going to have to help me uh, contact <laughs> whomever at the IOC. Okay. You know, I have a degree in broadcast journalism. I would love to be one of the commentators at the uh, Youth Equestrian Festival. Yes, that yes. would be great. <laughs> well, well, we'll talk about that because uh, maybe okay. you, maybe you and I can share the uh, the duties together. That would be yes. fantastic. Great, yes. uh, Donna. I was going to get back to you anyhow. Um, it was, I believe, it was in 1981 that you rode uh, for the USET. Yes, and in the uh, at that time, it was it was called the um, Young Riders Championships. Yes, yes, and it was in Mexico City. Correct. Uh, based on that experience, all these years later, what words of wisdom would you have to pass on to the young people watching this uh, webcast uh, who may have similar as aspirations that you did at 14, 15, 16 years old? Well, you know, Mel, I get contacted a lot via Facebook. A lot of parents contact me on behalf of their children because they want their child to get a pep talk or, or some um, sort of tips or what have you. And, you know, it, the game is so different now. I mean, <laughs> when I was coming up and I come from a upper middle class family, and it was accessible. It really was accessible. And, and I must say, Mel, I can, I can only speak to their motivation, their desire, and their love. When it comes to actually the financial part, I'm at a loss. Um, I can't speak to that because it is so far out of the reach of so many. Uh, with regards to one person in particular, uh, a mother, call, uh, contacted me via Facebook for their daughter who was dealing with not feeling like she belonged at the barn where she, where in, where she was riding and training. And this was in relation to a um, Elle magazine article that just came out in October. And so I, all I could tell the, and can tell these young people is your focus has to be on your partnership with the horse. When I was training and, and getting ready for competitions, wanting to be popular with people, wanting to be accepted by people was not my priority. I wanted to beat them I wasn't interested in being friends with them. I wanted to develop a relationship with my horse. I always only had one compared to some of the wealthier riders that had multiple and that was okay because I put my efforts, my focus, my priority on my horse. I did not look to the equestrian environment and the barn environment to satisfy any of my social needs. It was not going to, and I was not interested. So I really think that horses are amazing. And, and like JP said, they do not discriminate. And that's where I suggest young people, they shift their focus on the horses that they have available to them, whether it's a half lease, a full lease, a lesson horse or whatever, that horse and horses are therapeutic. And so if there are issues, racist issues, racial issues, discrimination or what have you that were going on in that environment, the, the therapy comes with the relationship with the horse. And that's where I always, I always redirect and always direct to the horses because they are therapeutic emotionally and physically, and they are the way we are going to accomplish our goals. Absolutely.
Absolutely. Um, we're going to wrap up in just a few minutes, but I do want to get back to Gigi uh, with a question about uh, Africa. And, and then I want to get uh, to Sandra and hear some more about her wonderful line of products. Uh, she, as I said before, is one of the few black entrepreneurs in the equestrian industry. And I would be remiss uh, if we did not hear from her uh, before we close today. So Gigi, I wanted to ask a question in terms of the organization known as ACES. I know uh, that two years ago when Mary Binks was here, she spoke very highly of the formation of the African Confederation for Equestrian Sports. So could you give us a, a brief update as to what is going on on the continent with that organization and what you also see as the future for involving a, a, a wider diversity of, of athletes, uh, particularly on the African continent? Yes, um, ACES has, I think they, we established it in 2016, and it is, it is actually growing slowly. Obviously, it's, it, it was a challenge this year for everyone, um, but the continental, um, the continental competition is being formed now, which is, for, for, for Africa, fantastic, just to be able to touch some medals, um, we had the African Youth Games, we had the African Games in, in Egypt and the African Youth Games in Algeria. Um, it was fantastic to see them. We also sent a team, we got a silver medal for our youth. And um, so yes, it's growing, it's developing. We now, we're now also looking at regional competition within Africa because Africa via ANOCA is also in, in various zones. So to get a a regional structure going with those that have equestrian sport, then from they filter it into the the continental sport. So yeah, I hope I answered your question. Is there any any? Yes, and 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 how can we get more information? about what's going on equestrian wise on the African continent uh, to the rest of the world. I mean, it's, it's very, very hard. If I did not know Mary, it would have been very hard to uh, even know about ACES. Uh, how, what efforts are being made to get the word out to a broader audience around the world? And, and how, how can we here in the US and in other metropolitan countries help out? It's been really inspirational, this, this, this panel. I really enjoyed it. I also learned um, and realized there is a huge gap in how do we get information out, like you just said. Yes, we do need help. Um, that is something that we can discuss and figure out um, with ACES to get more, more media. Um, there's definitely a huge, huge um, not a, there is a gap in getting enough media cover on what the athletes are doing um, in the sport, yeah. Very good, very good. All right, thank you. Uh, Sandra, I want to get back to you uh, to hear more about your product line, and then we'll go back to Julian to hear what life after the badminton horse trials might uh, entail and involve. Sandra. Hi, hi I'm Melvin. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to just um, piggyback off the back of um, what Donna was saying about um, progression just quickly. Um, we're actually doing, we, we had a report in the Horse and Hound recently. I'm actually trying to do something positive in trying to bridge that gap between grassroots and competition that we, we have our, um, a lot of riders fall into. So what I'm doing as part of my company is I'm doing a, a, a very small stage one pilot study of a scheme that we're gonna try and get a residential center and it's called the B-Race Center, which is the Bain Equine and Rural Activity Center of Excellence so that we can give young people that stepping stone over that gap so they can either go into sport or they can go into the industry with higher industry standards. So this is what we're trying to do at the moment. Now, the reason why we're doing this very small study at the moment is because we want to gather the information to see if it's going to work. We don't want to be jumping in four feet and, and not having any information. So we're doing that at the moment and it's being supported by the British Equestrian Federation. It's being supported by the Horse and Hound. And we have got people on board that are looking at this and seeing if this could help you know, make a positive move towards maybe giving many people a center of their own to try and sort of give them a level playing field so that they can move forward. Now, obviously uh, you were talking about my um, 
my company. Um, I'm, I, I invented the world's first liquid feed for horses. And one of the biggest problems that we have with horses is, is colic and, and dehydration. And so um, I invented um, this liquid feed that actually helps to hydrate horses. Um, and it's very natural, it's made of fibre and it's very, very um, palatable. So the, the saying you can lead a horse to water but you can't make it drink, well we can now make horses drink as much as we want to drink and because of the fact that it's very um, natural and fibre, it actually creates a reservoir in the hind gut. So it, it's a, it, I've just got a European patent on it and I'm the first one, well, I'm, I'm the ninth black woman in the UK to have gained a, a European patent, but I'm the first black woman in the world to have got a patent on an equine feed. So it's really exciting. I've just won the, the National Black British Business Awards in the UK. Um, and so, and also I won the Veterans Awards because um, I'm an ex-REF veteran, um, uh, Entrepreneur of the Year last year. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting all the awards in because one of the things I found being a black person in the industry is people don't give you credit for what you do. I, I have to wear my credentials on my on my chest pocket because people look at me and one of the questions I get a lot is who you know how come someone like you's invented this well why shouldn't I why shouldn't I invent it why should I have to be questioned of my knowledge you know I go around the world and I teach vets in all over the world about equine nutritional hydrotherapy it's a concept that I designed I made that concept up. And the fact that it has now been proven, and it's a proven concept, for seven years it's been proven, we, we, have, fed, we have the EGB, which is the Endurance GB champion 2018, who did 2,700 kilometers on this alone. Nothing else, just hay, water, and, 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 and the product called Equigel. It, 2,700 kilometers, you know, and so, it, it's proven it has you know it has this place but because I'm a black person in a white predominantly white middle class um, industry I'm just sort of brushed away well I'm sorry people <laughs> this is mother nature in a bucket and at the end of the day it is doing what it says on the tin and it's had a, it's got a pattern and it's doing really well but the fact that I'm here and I'm inspiring other people not just in the equine industry um, but other black females in, in industry, in business, you know, I'm here to help inspire them as well. So that's just a little bit about me. <laughs> well, you certainly have inspired us today, Sandra, and I, I want to thank you very much for being, being part of this. This is, this is really, <laughs> truly inspiring. Uh, Marvin, you ever have, have a comment? Yes, Sandra, how do you get it? Where's your website? I want that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have a special one for you, Marvin. It's called Enduragel, and it's specially for endurance horses and horses that are um, performing at a higher level. So yeah. any horses that are working above 100K a day, yeah. that's, what, that's what this is for, Enduragel. Oh, my so, gracious. Yeah. I got a bunch of people that will get that from yeah. here in we, Georgia. Yeah. So, <laughs> One of the reasons that I was so excited about having her on the panel is because there is a real need for her product in this yes. country. So, so what's I'm, the name of it? So and what I'm hoping, how do I get it? What I'm hoping that will we'll come out of this conversation with yeah. everyone involved is that we can put together some sort of a distribution network for your product in this country where it is that's so funny. sorely needed. And uh, that's, that's yeah. one of the hopes that we want to do. So Marvin, if you want to be the Atlanta, the Atlanta area distributor, uh, <laughs> along with Donna in California, I think we've got a business going. I would love to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can, I just, can I just let you know something very quickly? Yes. Um, I was actually asked by the Australian government to actually provide it over in Australia with the bushfires that were going on over there for the animals wow. over there but I did not have a distributor in the country so although it, it's biosecurity safe there's nothing that can, can um, cause any issues with biosecurity it's just getting the distributors in the right places to take on the product that's all it is we can manufacture it it's just getting it out there so if you obviously know anybody that will take on the distributor partnership then I'm happy to work with them to get this this product out there for you all right and and we also Gigi need to find some distributors for her in in Africa I've actually been out to uh, to South Africa, and I I went to the Ferris Smith 200, mm -hmm. and I, I went there a couple of years ago, and that was an amazing, amazing uh, event. 
but it was desperately needed out there. Absolutely desperately needed Absolutely. out there. Absolutely. I'm, I'm and thinking also in East Africa, certainly in Kenya and Uganda, uh, there's, and there's the probably rhinos, quite a need there too. And with the, the rhinoceroses and the wild animals out there, I worked with the vets out there that worked with the, the wild animals and they were very keen on it. But it's just getting the distribution ship. That's the, these are the problems that we have. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Uh, this has been truly inspiring. We're going to wrap up in just a few minutes and really open the floor up to questions. But I want to go back to Julian Seaman uh, and, and uh, get his thoughts and, his, and, and thank him very much for helping us to direct the conversation. Uh, Julian, you've served for so many years. And, and as I said before, from, from my heart, Whenever I've been in your press room, it's been a joy. I have felt respected. I have felt honored. Uh, it's always a pleasure to walk into your press room and see your smile. Whereas in other situations, you know, black, white, or, or otherwise, you don't get that. And so I, I, I want to congratulate you on your many years of service uh, at the Badminton Horse Trials and also uh, your many years of, of, of friendship that you've offered to me. Uh, he's muted. Oh. There we go. Uh, Julian, you're muted still. Hold on. Here we go. I'm yeah, here. there we go. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Um, no, when I came out to, to North Carolina last year, which was great, small little setup, but what you've done this time actually is fantastic because it's it's got people in from all around the world and it's been much longer it's been much more detailed and and we've learned so much about it, it it's really really good and you know um we're all going to keep getting together now we've all got the link in um this actually is the way to go for this gig it really is it's fantastic well, I was going to save it until the very end, but I will go ahead and share with you that we are already planning uh, for the third annual Day of the African in Question. As most of you know, uh, my wife and I hosted a reception during the World Africa, excuse me, the World Equestrian Games. Uh, my wife and I hosted a reception during the World Equestrian Games, which were held uh, here in North Carolina. And it was very successful. And uh, last year, we decided that we would have, as an adjunct to the, the Day of the African Equestrian, uh, a, uh, yes, Cedric, we would, we would, we would have uh, a seminar uh, honoring uh, one of the great equestrians of this country. Uh, and it turned out into what we now have is, 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 is this, uh, event, which is even greater than we ever expected. So yes, I, I, I agree, Julian, that this is the way to go. I think uh, we're all learning day by day a little bit more about this technology called Zoom. Uh, there are a number of other platforms that, that we're looking at as well. It's, it's been much bigger this year, much more international. And, and be, between last year and now, an awful lot has been done. An awful lot has been done. Um, you know, big full page with Sandra in Horse and Hound, twice actually. Uh, all of that's really, really good. It's fun. It's fun. That's what we say. It's got to be fun. Well, it is. It is. It is. And again, the, Tom, the Town Bass uh, Seminar will be part of our activities for next year. Uh, we don't have a date as of yet, but uh, we are working very hard to, to put in some even bigger plans uh, for, for, for next year. So we want all of you to be, be part of it. Um, with that said, I want to go ahead and open the floor uh, for a few minutes of questions. Uh, I see that there are a couple of questions that have come in from our audience. Uh, and I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to, to, to be heard. So uh, those of you who are in the audience, uh, please go ahead. And this is the time to ask questions via the, 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 uh, the chat. And we will try to uh, get as many of your questions answered uh, as quickly as we possibly can. But again, thank you very, very much for being part of the Tom Bass uh, seminar here in uh, the year 2020. Okay. Uh, one of the questions coming from the floor is someone would like uh, uh, answer about the leadership of the FEI and the USCF with, in, with, with regard to engaging uh, people of color in the leadership of the organizations. Uh, 
and they were asking if these FEI and the USCF are uh, having diversity training with, uh, for members of their staff. Uh, JP, could you address that? Yes, um, I think now in Lausanne, we are uh, 22, 23 different nationality. And um, many people come from uh, different continent and uh, without uh, this position. And it's very open. And all the, our positions are open around the world. We don't have any uh, process to select any. It's really open. And uh, our positions uh, are open regarding the competencies and uh, regarding the, the level of knowledge, of course, because uh, we, are, um, we are a governing body for equestrian sport. And uh, we are also uh, in charge to administrate uh, international sport around the world. We have a different transversal department, like a juridic department or legal department, sorry, or a vet department. And of course, uh, for this department, uh, the sport or the selection by sport is totally uh, open. We don't have a special selection. It's just a question of competencies and whatever. Very good. Marvin, what comes next for you? Uh, Mute. You're muted. <laughs> What comes next for me? Um, so uh, I, I sustained an injury uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, I was riding this horse and she fell and then I landed on my butt. So I've got a tailbone injury, but I'm still riding. I'm riding with my do <laughs> not. <laughs> nothing can't keep me out of the saddle. So uh, I am looking forward to uh, it's per perhaps in January, starting back over with, um, endurance rides. Uh, I've got a few young horses that I'm working with that I'll take to um, uh, local uh, competitions and dressage and show jumping. And so my goal is to go to the, uh, the U.S. National Champions in Championship in Endurance in the uh, 100 miler. And then they also got a 50 miler that I want to enter. And that's going to be in May in Montana of 2021. And uh, I don't think I have enough time to really focus on the World Endurance Championships next summer, but anything's possible. If I can make that, I'll try that too. And then my ultimate goal is to, of course, uh, re qualify again for the World Equestrian Games so I could compete in endurance uh, in the next World Equestrian Games. Hopefully this time it'll be better because, you know, if, I don't know if all of you know, but, you know, Two years ago <laughs> in North Carolina, the endurance was a disaster at, at the World Equestrian Games. It, was, it turned out really, it was drama. <laughs> but hopefully we can have another shot and Bermuda can compete again against the world. That was really great. I had a good time, even though it was a bust. I still enjoyed it and met a lot of great people and enjoyed my experience despite of, you know, how everything went. So... That's my goal. Ride, ride, ride in the saddle all day. <laughs> <laughs> Amia, what comes next in your competitive career? Well, I mean, as everyone knows, COVID kind of derailed everything. Um, I was planning on going to the Adequan Global Dressage Festival in January on a borrowed horse, fingers crossed. Um, however, I don't know if it's going to happen anymore. They had the try on competition on October, so it makes me think they might still have it. Um, my hope is to be able to qualify, get enough scores that I need to do like the KPIs and get on the emerging athletes list and, um, you know, make my way up to the top. And I'm hoping if the world gets back to normal soon, either Paris 2024 or LA 2028, you know, I, I like to dream big here. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, um, overall, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic for the future, especially after seeing this, I, I feel so heard. I feel so seen. I feel so hopeful for the future with all these amazing, wonderful people of color and allies coming together to, make change affect change and you know air our our thoughts and feelings and opinions and overall I think this was an amazingly positive experience an amazing learning experience a great you know networking experience this this 
you know, Melvin, you're a genius. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> 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 and overall, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm optimistic for a future where people of color will be in the driver's seat instead of, you know, wherever else we're at, we are now. <laughs> and, um, I, I, I'd like to, to see that sooner rather than later. And, Overall, you know, I'm, I'm happy for the progress we've made thus far. And, you know, in pair dressage, I'm so thankful for, you know, the head coach, Michelle Asulon and Hope Han, president of USPA, and Laureen from USCF, and, you know, all of the amazing accepting people in our community that are so willing to have us move forward. And, you know, couldn't do it without you guys, couldn't do it without without this community and this community really means a lot to me and I'm so honored to be here. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, Gigi, uh, what's on the uh, drawing board uh, as, as, as you take over for Mary uh, in, in, in terms of representing the FEI in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa? What, what are the, th the initiatives that we can look forward to hearing about uh, this time next year? I would like to um, definitely invite um, one or two of our athletes in Group 9 will try and to this panel so that you can get their perspective as well. That's, um, and then also, obviously, the initiative is to try and get the news out there better for, for the world to know more of what we do in Africa. Um, like I said, our, our federations are really tiny. They're, they're in development structure, but the whole ACES um, has really helped to give us a bit more of a lift towards, um, you know, achieving continental uh, status. Very, very good. And Donna, what's coming next in your illustrious and multifaceted uh, career? Well, uh, emphasis on multifaceted, because <laughs> I actually have two television projects that ground to a halt because of COVID. So right now I'm just um, holding steady and, and I do have horses in training, um, but I feel that I'm, on, I'm in the twilight of my career and reinventing myself. And um, yeah, so after COVID, I'm hoping that these projects will gain traction and um, I'll move into television. Very good. Okay. Uh, Sarah and Emily, what can we uh, expect uh, next uh, uh, to hear from you? Uh, hear from you. All right, so <laughs> thank you for the question. Um, as far as this sourcing around is concerned, we're gonna continue to try to reach as many people in the, in the non-equestrian um, site community as well as equestrians. So you have anything you want to add? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sarah checked out a little bit. <laughs> but no, we definitely got a blank. Right, well, we want, we, want, we, want, we want to salute you uh, as well as all of the other uh, panelists for, for a job well done. And you have certainly, as I said before, opened the eyes of many, many of us around the country. So uh, very much appreciate your being part of this. Thank you so much Thank for having us. Certainly. Uh, Caitlin, what, what can we expect next uh, from your organization? Okay, Caitlin's not here anymore. Oh, okay. Um, it's just me, Abriana. Abriana, uh, that's okay. We, we, we understand. That's, that's good. We're <laughs> happy to have you. <laughs> um, so Caitlin runs a nonprofit called Saddle Up and Read. So she's been really involved with that, distributing books for kids. As far as Young Black Equestrians, the podcast, we still want to uh, share the stories of Black horsemen and women all around the world and uh, get more involved. Once, you know, COVID goes away, we want to do more of um, like a blogging or a vlogging aspect of it, going around to these different places and actually getting the stories and the history. Um, like Mia said earlier, things that are passed down um, generation to generation and be able, being able to capture those stories and tell them um, simply because not everyone has someone around them that can do that. So that is our ultimate goal with um, YBE and to turn that into a TV show. So Donna, we might have to talk to you. <laughs> that would be a fabulous connection, I'm sure. I'm going to watch that show for sure. Like, you guys <laughs> tell me what channel it's on. I'm, uh, I'm already watching it. Uh, uh, Elizabeth McCall, uh, what sort of projects uh, can we expect to hear from you in the next uh, year or two? 
Oh, you're muted still, Elizabeth. No. Uh, really putting horses in the public eye and through film and entertainment and live events is really my focus and interest. Very good. I uh, just happened to uh, find uh, just last night the uh, interview that you and I did uh, at Cavalia. Uh, and uh, I think uh, after all these years, it, 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 it still, uh, still stands uh, as, as, as a testament to the, the work that they put into that show and, and really opening a lot of people's eyes about the possibility of horses. I had a number of friends who had nothing to do at all with the horse industry that uh, were calling me and saying, you got to see this show. This show is so fantastic. So uh, your part in it is, is, is something that is, is definitely remembered. And uh, yeah, that interview uh, I just put up on the website last night, it's, it, it, it still stands, it's uh, with Normand, it still stands uh, the test of time. So that was, that was very, 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 very good. Uh, oh, they were good interviews. He got them all. I, I will say one Melvin helped me make a dream come true at one time uh, I always was a big fan of Mr. Ed the Talking Horse TV series and I had the good fortune of interviewing Alan Young who played Wilbur before his death and Melvin shot it it was, yeah, I, was <laughs> I was a camera operator on that gig and yeah uh, you produced it and, yeah <laughs> Yeah, I, I really, really uh, will also just uh, say that was a highlight of my life as well. I've always been a big fan of that show. And uh, actually, uh, Pamela and I uh, just recently bought uh, both, both volumes of The Best of Mr. It. So it's very near and dear to our hearts. <laughs> uh, Mimi and so thank Sophie, uh, thank you both so much. What can we expect uh, uh, competitive-wise from, from the two of you? What are your uh, goals for the next year or so uh, in terms of competition? Um, thanks so much for having us on this panel. Um, I think that we're just going to be heading down to WEF. Um, uh -huh. I don't know if Mimi has any specific goals in general, but I think just competing there and seeing how it goes with COVID. And just keep winning, please. <laughs> Mimi? Yeah, the plan is to see how coronavirus affects the show and who can um if the show can even happen with everything that's going on but hopefully fingers crossed it will and yeah that's where i'll be heading next and hopefully i guess my goals are to continue to keep pia in grand prix very good very good sally what what, what projects uh, are you working on um, well, I'm really excited because I am on the steering committee of a new um, allyship initiative that has just launched this week. It's called Strides for Equality Equestrians. Um, it was predominantly started in the eventing space, but we, over discussions that have been happening since the summer, decided that we didn't need to limit ourselves and shoehorn ourselves with only eventing. So we expanded to be equestrians. You can see the logo there. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so we just launched this week and our goal is to, um, we have a, a pin, a lapel pin that can be worn um, in support of our uh, friends and allies and BIPOC riders all over the country so that whenever you go to a show and you can show your visible allyship, it helps to create a larger community for all riders. Um, the second aspect of Strides for Equality will be a mentorship arm. We have a high performance eventing writer, Matt Brown, who has joined the panel of uh, steering members and he's really into the idea of mentorship and, and bridging the gap from access to horses to a career in horses or a professional career or competitive career. Um, so his goal is to really, our goal is to really try to bring in um, funding to give to talented writers that maybe don't have access to training or um, even if they're not necessarily into writing and they want to do journalism, farrier work, veterinary work, be a judge, anything like that, that's kind of our goal is to help um, network. And uh, I had a really great talk this week with Caitlin of Saddle Up and Read, and we talked about how we can best support nonprofit organizations. Um, Donna, I would love to be able to talk with you. Uh, sometimes I, I'm a huge fan. I'm a little starstruck right now, actually, to be honest. But, um, you know, I think it's important to have uh, important, you know, writers who are well known that are wanting to help and be involved. And I think it's going to take a collaborative effort from all of us. So um, that's kind of my personal pet project that I've been working on. It was not my idea, but I'm honored to be involved and um, also honored to be a part of this panel. So thank you so much for having me. Very good, very good. And Tori, uh, what sorts of wonderful photographs and insightful articles uh, are you planning uh, to share with us all? 
Um, at the moment, I'm working on this piece with a writer who was formerly part of the Compton Judy Posse, and now she writes for Writers United. Um, so that's a piece I am working on at the moment. And Deontay Sewell, who I did a feature on for the Chronicle, we're going to do blogs with him as well. So I think for everyone who is interested in his article, they'll get an update on what he's been up to at um, Philip Dutton's barn and just a few more pieces. But, you know, we're closing out the year starting, I think in the next week or so, we'll have our annual meeting, start planning out features for 2021 and things like that. Well, keep up the good work. <laughs> keep up the good work. Okay, uh, JP, any, any, anything further to add from the FEI's perspective? Oh, we are like uh, all the world in a tricky, complicated situation. And uh, as you know, the international sport is uh, actually in a hard situation. We can't uh, have our main show. All the big shows are canceled. Actually, the indoor season is not well engaged. Mm. about uh, the main uh, events. Fortunately, uh, we continue uh, on one, two and three stars because um, this competition are in a equestrian center, a question place, but many uh, all uh, exposition all are too expensive to take the risk for the organizer to, to start. And for this reason, uh, we can, we have can, lots of shows are cancelled, World Cup and many issues. Now we hope uh, as soon as possible the vaccine, the vaccine for all and to restart a normal, uh, normal rhythm. But as you know, Europe actually uh, is in a very, very bad situation. France, England, uh, Germany, uh, Spain, all Belgium is, is really, really, really hard. And uh, the transport, the, the, the travel are impossible. But we continue with uh, energy. We continue to fight uh, to develop sport and to organize in uh, many places, so in competition. And we hope, we hope also the Olympic Games in Tokyo because it's for us uh, our next, next, uh, important time for all the sport in the world, but for FEI uh, as international and Olympic sport, it's very important to, to go in, in uh, this Olympic games in Tokyo. And we cross the finger now to be in Tokyo next year. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, Martha, <laughs> uh, what, what, what next uh, can we, expect uh, from your career you 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 I, I have to publicly uh acknowledge the very wonderful work that you've done over the last year uh, particularly the outstanding article you did on our friend uh, Todd goodwin uh the uh, first black master of foxhounds uh, uh, to be recognized in this country uh what what other outstanding and interesting uh, very diverse pro projects uh, and it's not just Todd you've written about a number of other uh, uh, black and, and, and brown equestrians as well what uh, projects can we expect uh, to see from you in the next year that's thanks to my very good um, the great editor editorial team at the Chronicle at Tori and Affirm as well and in, in trusting me with the top story and finding the other the other stories about um Andrea Davenport and yes. um, Wendy Sasser and hopefully upcoming, I believe, um, David Lohman. Um, I was just writing these great stories that I was to find. I'm like Donna. I sort of have some flexibility right now to redefine myself. Um, I definitely want to interview everyone who was on the panel today and get their stories out. Um, you know, I also, going a little bit beyond just horses, I uh, live near Richmond where sort of ground zero of the statues being removed and um, in addition to the um, kind of stories that catch the, the news media about violence or conflict um, related to removing Confederate statues, it's actually um, created a huge groundswell of public art related to social justice and the history of the city of Richmond and whose history has been told. And so there's a lot of interesting stories there that I'm looking forward to maybe um, finding some interesting stories and making sure that more people hear about them. So there's, there's 
accessibility um, and retelling history and who gets to tell history in, in the horse area and the artistic area. There's just a lot of a lot of possibilities right now, which is great. Fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. Um, any other comments, questions? Uh, I don't see any other questions coming in from the, from the audience. Um, we're going to keep this open. Uh, certainly those of you in the audience who have additional questions, uh, please email them. Uh, the, uh, our, our, our marketing team will be very, very happy to get them to the, to the right people. Uh, I want to, again, thank every one of our panelists. I know it's been a long day, but it's been a very productive day. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for making time to say to the world that this is important, that issues of diversity in the equestrian community are very, very important. Uh, I also want to publicly thank uh, several uh, organizations uh, that have really made this happen. And first and foremost, I want to thank the Tryon International Equestrian Center. Uh, I've actually been sitting uh, in their facility all day. Uh, they have provided uh, absolute uh, technical support. They have provided uh, public relations support. They have provided just about everything that we've asked them to provide uh, for the second year running. And quite honestly, this event today would not have happened without their 100% support of diversity issues you know, in the equestrian field. Uh, I also want to thank our friends at HorsesDaily.com, uh, the Chronicle of the Horse, and and certainly uh, uh, Leslie and her crew at EventingNation.com and their affiliated publications. Uh, again, we thank all of these people for uh, going out of their way to make sure that this happened and happened in the right manner. Uh, we will be posting, as I said before, a couple of the videos uh, to the website, which is sportsquestinternational.com. Uh, they will be posted uh, later tonight, uh, certainly available to you uh, in the morning. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for uh, you know, hanging out with us uh, today. I think we've accomplished quite a bit. Uh, last year, we spent a good part of our day talking about the problem. And then we spent a little bit later talking about solutions. I think today we've been primarily talking about solutions. We've heard some very, very, very wonderful ideas. We've heard uh, some very concrete uh, plans that have already been put into motion. And that is a good thing. So uh, as we close out this year and look forward to 2021 and beyond, uh, I think that the, the message is very, very positive. And I think that we can all look, look back at today uh, with a great deal of pride and, and a good feeling. And I thank each and every one of you. Uh, we will look forward to seeing you next year, if, if not before. And we will certainly be in touch. Uh, I'll be distributing uh, information uh, about today. Uh, we've recorded uh, this session. So it will be uh, uh, posted to the web uh, and certainly shared uh, uh, with the world uh, for, for their edification uh, very, very shortly. So again, on behalf of all of those who participated in the, event, in the event today, on behalf of our sponsors and supporters, I want to say thank you. Thank you very, very much. And we will see you next year. Stay safe Can and stay well, thing? my friends. God bless. Nice to meet you all. Thanks. Bye, bye everyone. <laughs> bye, 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 guys. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you. Bye, God bless. Bye. God bless. We I love you all. Bye. I've been trying Bye. to answer some messages, but I can't do it. <laughs> JP, I, I'm cheating. I need to get in touch with JP and Sandra. Okay, uh, I'll be uh, Marvin. I'll be distributing. I'll be distributing the mailing list. I'll, I'll send oh, the mailing list out tonight. Because I tried to answer the messages, but I don't know how to do it. Okay, I'll I'll send out the mailing list to everyone. Okay. All right, great. I'll okay, God bless JP everyone. Happy Bye. holidays, but Bye. please be on. Bye. Stay safe and well. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>